you got your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Genesis? Chapter 37. The title of this message is, I hope they say that about me. That's the title of it. I'm going to do it in three parts tonight, tomorrow morning, part two, and then tomorrow night, part three. If you can't stay for some of the other ones, maybe you can get it or order it and we'll get it to you. The title of it is, I hope they say that about me. My favorite preaching and study of the Bible is what I call expository preaching. Where you take one verse or one statement. And you just rip into it. I want to talk about a wonderful man named Joseph. Joseph. A favorite kid. A spoiled child. But with great qualities. Looked like his mama. Comes from a polygamous situation. Jacob was a polygamist. Two different mothers. One father. Now that can be trouble. Jacob loved Rachel. But she had a hard time having children. And did die, I believe, in childbirth. Joseph was a wonderful boy. And one thing you should never do if you got more than one child is show favoritism. Because that is the beginnings of great jealousy and envy. But Jacob couldn't help himself. Because he loved Joseph. Joseph was very good at what he did. He didn't have a lot of wisdom in the beginning. You don't tell an older brother that they're going to serve the younger brother because you're going to get whipped. (laughs) They're going to fight you. Because for some reason, the oldest child seems to think that they, they, you know, that all the other kids got to submit to them or the brothers and the sisters and all that kind. For some reason, I don't know why, but just the way it is. But there's a statement in Genesis chapter 37 that I love, and I'm, 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 I'm going to focus on that. Jacob sent Joseph to do some things. He began to have dreams. You see, the world would not exist without dreamers. They make things happen. They take impossible things and make them possible. I have been a dreamer and a visionary since the day I was born. I was a unique child. I was a veil baby, which is very, 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 uh, what's the word I want to use? Rare. Rare. When I was born, my mother thought I did not have any eyes or nose or mouth. (laughs) Kathy's helping me preach here. And my mother said, oh, look, something's wrong. But the doctor, that was in Algiers, Louisiana, Dr. LaRocca, LaRocca's Hospital. Me and Michael Mille were born in the same hospital and delivered by the same doctor. And he's on the West Bank of New Orleans. My mother said, look, he has no face, he has no eyes, he has no nose, he has no mouth. And Dr. LaRocca said, look at here, a veil, baby. Mama said, what? She says, very rare. I had a piece of skin from, if you notice that, I don't have wrinkles, I got cracks. <laughs> but this one right here that's real long was a, ple- a complete piece of skin all over, over my face to here. And all you could hear, I was trying to breathe, I guess. He said, look at here, a veil, baby. And there's, there's, there's know, this old wives here that this child would be somebody special or whatever, something like that. Mama said, get that thing. Where's his eyes? It was, you know, so he pulls it off and there I was. <laughs> and Dr. Rock was, he said, you have a veil, baby girl. He said, that's one out of maybe 20 million, 30 million people. And I, I remember as far back as I remember that I always wanted to do something. And everything I wanted to do, somebody told me I couldn't do it. You can't do that. That can't work. And it sounds like Joseph's brothers. You can't do that. Who do you think you are? And in Genesis chapter 37, verse 19, look what it says. And I'm going to just kind of quote it. He was walking toward him and they said, behold, this dreamer cometh." I hope they say that about me. Behold, this dreamer cometh. Am I having a problem with this microphone? Am I? Well, give me the handheld. Cut this thing off. 
Hallelujah. If you don't know how to speak in tongues, touch the end of this, and a Baptist will speak in tongues on the end of that day. <laughs> Behold, this dreamer cometh. I've always had a dream. When I went into the ministry, I began to tell people what God said I could do. They said, you can't do that. I've been in the ministry 40 years. I've been trying to do that. I said, that's the problem you've been trying. Now that made him mad. I said, God never told us to try. He said, be you therefore a doer. Not a try. I didn't try to marry Kathy. I married her. Just that simple. I allowed her to get into my life. <laughs> Kathy would follow me everywhere. I loved that. That has changed. In certain areas. And I told her, follow me. Because I'm going to do something. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to do something. My first job when I left here, the state of Louisiana, I went to Dallas and I needed a job. and Didn't have one because I got a wife that's going to get hungry. And I went and auditioned to play in a little nightclub. And they looked at me and said, you're a Cajun. You talk funny. I said, but you haven't heard me. You've never seen anybody like me. I will fill your house up. They looked at me, this cocky kid. He wasn't cocking this. I knew what I could do. They said, I said, can I do an audition? No. And by that time, two guys were pushing a piano out of this dining room. And, I, and this is in the foyer of this Dallas hotel. And I said, stop. Because I knew they weren't going to let me. And I just began to play in the foyer. And Chip, I kicked the piano stool out. Did little Jerry Lee Lewis. <laughs> Great balls of fire. I'm telling you, that everybody was cooking in that place. They noticed that people couldn't check in anymore. They just was listening. They said, you got a job. I said, when did I start? He said, tonight. Done. And that started my career as a musician. Playing piano. And then I, I play 11 different instruments and that, because I had prepared myself to do that. You see, when you're a dreamer, you got to have confidence in yourself. Write that down. you got to have confidence in the qualifications and the things that God has put inside of you. Now, they may have to be proven and tested and you may stumble, but that's all right. Because you're going to get up. Because these things will work for you, not some of the time, but all the time. Especially, and you can get so excited because it's God speaking through you by someone when they try to criticize you by saying, behold, this dreamer cometh. So you ought to be saying, I hope they say that about me. Now, to understand a dream, I want you to write this down. Until you see tomorrow, you will never understand today. Write this down. Until you see tomorrow, you will never understand today. There are a lot of people not understanding today because they're not looking at tomorrow. They don't understand tomorrow. They don't understand what they will do, going to do, what they got the ability to do if they're just willing to work hard enough to get it done. When I came, i never forget this. When I came to build, I, would, I never thought I would build a church because I was a traveling ministry. And the Lord asked me about this church. He said, how would you like for me to pay for this? Would you like me to pay for it every month for 30 years? That's okay. Or would you like me to pay for it cash? Some of you have heard me say that. I said, well, Lord, since we're talking, let's just knock this puppy out. And then he said this. Okay, but we will never discuss money anymore concerning this project. We built this place. It took us four years, the whole complex, the church, the executive offices, the production distribution center, television studios, all the different things, uh, 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 Christian education facilities, blah, blah, all that. There were times I wanted to talk to God about money, but he said we would never discuss it. So I refused. The three major banks in New Orleans said, you cannot do this. I said, watch me. Watch me. What they didn't know was. I can do all things through Christ. Not some things. I just wanted, I said, I can do it all. Now, there was very great temptations upon my part to talk to God about finances, but I refused. Because you see, I had saw tomorrow. And I already understood today. 
See, I knew the answer before it manifested. And I would shout and rejoice. Well, the whole place was completely, totally debt free. And been debt free. I've been debt free since 1982 myself. The ministry has been debt free completely. And everything we've ever touched has prospered. Simply because we understood what was coming. We focused on what was coming instead of what we had. When God told me he'd give me a jet, that was 1994. I'm going to give you a jet. A jet? Excuse me, 1978. I'm going to give you a jet. A jet? I can't fill up a Toyota. But can you see yourself flying? So I had Kathy put my face inside of an airplane on my magazine. Not to help you, to help me. Behold, this dream of coming. And so my first plane, I flew it for nine years. Oh, Lord, I mean, I flew that plane. Then Keith Moore wanted it. And Keith Moore flew it for, I don't know how long. And that same plane, my first plane today, is now being flown by Happy and Jeannie Caldwell of Victory Television Network there in Little Rock. In fact, they flew the plane here, my very first plane. Now, everybody said I couldn't do that. Well, they were right in the essence of that. But you see, my dream was already a reality. I could see myself flying when I couldn't even pay for gasoline. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? So until you see tomorrow, you will never understand today. So in other words, if you, what you're looking, if you are struggling today on your dream is because what you need to do is go home and start looking at tomorrow. Because tomorrow is going to give you a greater revelation of what's going on today. And the foundation of what you're believing for may be being built today. And you can't understand why it's been a struggle. But if you see tomorrow, you'll see the whole manifested thing. Now write this down if you, if, if, if you understand what I'm saying here. You were created to be sustained by having a vision of something bigger than just today. I'm always constantly dreaming about things that I can't do. But yet, God always says you can do all things through Christ. In every area of my life, spiritually, physically, financially. Me and Kathy always increases our giving every year. Been doing it all the year. We never just give the same thing. We're, we're increasing in faith on every level. Everything. Everything. Everything I've said without sounding prideful or arrogant. I have done. And yet, I've heard this. But boy, that dreamer, he's something. He just, who do you think he is? And I said, I'm so glad they say that about me. Because you see, they're seeing something that really they want. That's why, it's like one man said, I don't like your house. I said, no, you love my house. You don't like your house. <laughs> you love my house. You don't like yours. Because if I gave you my house, you'd shout. That's why you're mad. So if somebody says, I don't like your car. Say, no, no, you like my car. You don't like that trash you're driving. See, if they're criticizing you, it's because they want what you have. What they're trying to figure out is how'd you get it? So your vision has got to be, let me say it again, you were created to be sustained by having a vision of something bigger than just today. See, vision requires faith. And it also makes life more enjoyable. You're looking at a man that enjoys life. I enjoy being saved. I enjoy preaching the gospel. There's been times that God is my witness that I have been in a stood in a hotel room by myself, closed the door, turn on the light by the bathroom, look in the mirror and preach myself a revival. <laughs> Spit flying, preach it, give an altar call and answer it. <laughs> I've done it. Give an offering and receive it. Speak in tongues and interpret it. <laughs> Hallelujah. I was a success. I have done that I don't know how many times. Sometimes I need to hear the preaching of the word, so I preach to myself. One time driving my car, man, just out of the blue, I heard it coming out of me. I knew a message in tongues was coming forth. I said, there ain't nobody in the car but me. <laughs> Lord, what are you saying? I'm thinking this in my mind as I speak. He said, interpret it. Well, guess who was it for? <laughs> me. I gave myself a word of knowledge. Thus saith the Lord God Jesse. 
it came to pass within six hours. I hadn't even thought of it, brother. I said, God, I thought you can't use those gifts unless you had two people. He said, well, you one and I'm two. <laughs> it was a wonderful day. I hope they say that about me. So if you're not feeling too well, encourage yourself in the Lord. That's what David did and took the place over. Let me say it again. Vision requires faith and it also makes life more enjoyable. I enjoy it. And people get so mad at me because I enjoy my life. Who do you think you are? Well, sit your ugly self down and let me tell you who I am. And I start off, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was out form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of the Lord, God moved upon the waters. And God said, let's make Jesse. Let's make him in our image and in our likeness. Let's, let's give him our dream. That was a Joseph. Did he have problems? Yes. So? Brothers didn't like him, so they sold him to his cousins. He's a very type of Christ, really. I mean, if you think about it, just in every area. But you see, he was assessed, a dreamer, going somewhere to dream. See, not only would his dream would be fulfilled, but people around him's dream would be fulfilled. He just wasn't destined to bring his dream to pass. See, this visionary leadership company is not just destined to get my vision out here. It's to get yours. Let me make sure my... One day I'm coming to your visionary leadership company. One day I, I, I'm going to see your dream and operate and function in it. Why? Because God didn't give it to you for just yourself. He gave it for a world that needs what you believe in. So when you understand, I make ministry enjoyable I enjoy myself in the Lord <laughs> why not I have that ability to do so now I don't care where I'm at if I feel a shout coming on I shout it don't make no difference to me and I don't care if people get mad at me and try, I don't get embarrassed because when I wasn't saved if I wanted to do something crazy I just did it yeah, Kathy said that's the truth but <laughs> If I just wanted to do something nuts, I just did. I didn't care if anybody saw it. So if I got a shout coming on, I mean, I, one time I ran around a Walmart. They said, what you running from? I said, I'm not running from anything. I'm running to something. <laughs> Why are you running? I said, God's running with me. Wow, man. God, they think you're on drugs. <laughs> it didn't make no difference. God said, run, run. Well, is it embarrassing? Close your eyes. Ain't nobody see you. You love to run into something, though, if you don't. You know. Now, when you understand this, see, vision requires faith because it makes life more enjoyable. So, you see, instead of being, feeling bad about being persecuted at the beginning of my ministry, I seen the dream of this ministry. He said, I'll send you to the world. Now, my brother-in-law who gave that word, Jules, Jules was an atheist. Many of y'all may not know that he was a very successful lawyer in Homer, and he was an atheist. You got to understand, when he got saved, Deborah cooked him some converted rice. <laughs> she was a heathen too. Well, it says, now you're converted, you need to eat converted rice. Now, when God says an atheist, he, had, he does it publicly. I think I said in his front yard. Now, watch this. He believed everything I said because he understood my dream. I said, Jews got to heal anybody. We just believe. Now, and he's a lawyer. He said, Jesse ain't never lied to me before. He ain't lying. He said, okay. He said, Jesse, he called me up one time. He said, I, I, I got a lawsuit here. I told a lady, she's hurting some chicken place, pot hitter. She's all crippled look like this. He said, lady, I can get you some money or I can get you healed. Which one you want? That's what a baby Christian does because they dream. Ah, I just ready to go. She said, well, I just rather get healed. So he calls me. He said, Jesse, I'm bringing this crippled woman. And I told her, if you pray for her, she's going to be healed. She's going to get it, huh? Now that puts you on your knees. You said God would heal her. I said, bring her on. And I prayed for the rapture all that afternoon. <laughs> God. That was at Bayou Blue Assembly of God. Remember that, Jules? So watch this. I had that lady come and she's like this. 
And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, why couldn't it be a headache? Why can't it be something you can't see? And I said, lady, I even put a little black on. I want to let you know, lady, the Lord, the Lord, sweat running down the back of my leg. The Lord said, do you see a heel? Yeah. I see you healed. I said, I'm going to lay hands on you and God going to heal you. She's like this. <laughs> Jules jumps up and says, y'all watch this. <laughs> God, talk about pressure, man. <laughs> am I, am, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> I mean, she's just looking and she's thinking, she's Catholic. I don't think she's ever been in a spirit field meeting in her life. And I reached my hand, I said, Jesus, and her arm released and shot straight up. The place went crazy, including me. <laughs> and I got a reputation, but hold that healer cometh. Jules got so excited, he tried to call Chauvin's funeral home. Can we get some dead bodies? Am I telling the truth? <laughs> some dead bodies. Because my brother-in-law had never lied to me. And he said God could raise the dead. And just how I'm going to bring them dead by. And you just lay hands on them. Sure, Jules. <laughs> Thank God he couldn't get any dead bodies. Good God. <laughs> that was the beginning of my dream. And it got on him. And it got on people. Because it was enjoyable. Have you ever seen somebody's dream that was just aggravating? But this one was enjoyable. Write this down. Dreams and visions keep you prepared. Why? Satan can't keep sneak up on you because you're ahead of him all the time. See, when you're dreaming, dreams and your visions keep you prepared for what's coming. For what's coming. You see what I'm saying? So what do you want? Thank you, Lord. Let me say something that some people are not going to like. Quit asking God for a need. That's an insult to him. He said he'd supply all your need called his riches and glory. Why don't you get over into the area of desire and want? Let him handle the need. You don't even need to be concerned about that. See, your children don't ask you for needs. They tell you what they want. They know that you're going to provide food and clothes for them. So they don't say, Mama, I need. No, they say, Mama, this is, uh, I want this. And you don't think that's greed when a child tells you what they want. So why do you think it's a greed thing to ask your Heavenly Father and tell Him what, what you want? Because all it is is family asking family. Meredith, my granddaughter, she's made seven years old. She's coming up with more stuff than I, I we can imagine. It's amazing. I asked her something. She said, let me think about it. She'll walk off. She came to my house that day and I had finished jogging. I took a shower. But sometime when you have your friends, you still perspire maybe 20 or 30 minutes after it. I hugged and I said, you love grandfather? She said, did you wash your whole body? <laughs> I said, yes, I did. She said, you might want to wash a little more. I immediately got over there and went and washed a little more. Seven years old, my God. Just told it to me. I have a beautiful home, God. And I said, Meredith, would you like grand? She come and she said, Grandfather, is this a palace? I said, No, it's not. It's, it belongs. This is a, it's Mimi's house and grandfather's house. I said, Would you like for me to give you my house? She goes, I'll build my own house. <laughs> She's already got the dream. See, we're producing that dream in her. I hope they say that about me. You see, when you know what you are pursuing, write it down. And when you know what is coming, your days become faster and easier. When you know what you're pursuing, and when you know what is coming, your days become faster and easier. That's a fact. In everything you do. Because God is providing these things for you to complete this dream. So he had that 
reputation, behold, this dreamer cometh. Little did they realize they were talking to their future boss. Don't be nice to everyone. Because they may be your future boss. You know what I'm saying? You just never know if somebody will apply themselves to do something. All of a sudden, you're now working for them. And you know why? Because what's the most valuable thing you can find in life? Let me help you. You know what it is? An idea. It's simply an idea. Microsoft, an idea. Carnegie said, let's build cities out of steel. An idea. I got an idea to shut down all water shortages in California. How about a pipeline of water? We got enough water here to flood California. (laughs) We can sell it. We can make a fortune. You got oil pipelines. You got electrical pipelines. We got water. We will never run out of water. We can fill up your reservoirs, California. We'll pump it down under the ground for you. Because one storm will replenish it for us. We have fat rain. In South Louisiana. People said, they only go get two inches. We can get two inches in ten minutes. Uh, how many of y'all remember the May 8th flood? 1995. Remember that? It was 18 and a half inches of rain. I thought Noah was coming down the street. I lost my car at the airport. I called the airport. Can you see my car? They said, only the antenna. (laughs) I was the first corporate jet to land after May 8th, after the flood. There was 1,100 homes flooded or 1,400 homes. 1,100 homes flooded in Armand. I'm telling you, you, it was amazing. I ain't never seen that much water in my life. I did a calculation on the flood of Noah. How much water fell to cover the mountains at that time? You know how much it was? 105 inches an hour. That's a waterfall. Because God opened up the deep and the atmosphere. It was coming up this way and coming down this way. So we can help California. We can help Arizona. We can turn your deserts to bloom for a price. Because <laughs> our dreams cost money. But that's all right. You can grow stuff. Pipelines. Why had anybody thought of that? You know you spend more money for a bottle of water than you do for gasoline? You know that just a little bottle of water costs more than a whole gallon of gasoline. There's such money to be made. And you can use it for the gospel's sake or for your family, whatever you want. Think about that for a minute. And I'm talking about fresh water. I ain't talking about desalination plants, which is nothing wrong with that. But I'm talking about fresh water. If we can just grab the silt that's coming out the Mississippi River. If we just let the Mississippi River flood down from Venice, just flood. we'll build back the Delta so quick, it's amazing. But see, all companies blocked it up so they can get those big rigs and all that stuff out of there. See, God has prepared all this. But you got to have a dreamer to dream it. Every time I get in my plane, I mean every time, I think about Wilbur and Arbor Wright. I couldn't have had a jet, but then them two guys without believing that they could build a plane. Brother Mark just got him a new plane. He's all excited about this. It. a blessing of God. Oh, Jesus, man. Why? It goes fast, Mark. Oh, this thing is fast. Wait, I mean, you're going to experience, you're going to have more time to do things. It's going to be a blessing. And it's for a blessing. I said, you asked me to believe for it. He said, anything else you want to talk about? Because he don't blink at that kind of stuff. Let me say it again. When you know what you are pursuing, and when you know what is coming, your days become faster and easier. Now listen to this, write this down. You're not receiving according to how fast God can do things. You're receiving according to your faith. 
And that's Matthew 9, 29. According to your faith, be it unto you. You're not receiving according to how fast God can do something or do things. You're receiving according to your faith. So where's your faith level is? If you want more of it, yeah. Go to church more. Faith cometh by hearing. Faith cometh. Don't stack up. It don't come by heard. It come by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. And if you can't go there, get some tape, not tape, what do you call them, CD, DVD, whatever you, you know, whatever. It didn't make any difference. It's according to your faith. I remember the day, didn't it, that I said, Lord, I have increased my faith. And immediately my manifestation increased. Bam. See, everybody's always telling you you're waiting on God. You ain't waiting on God. God's ready. Because he'd do it real quick. But it's according to your faith to receive it. Be it unto you. Now you got to remember, there's always somebody telling you you can't have that. They don't know what they say. It's what God said. So when I told people, I never forget, I was so disappointed. I was so excited when God told me he's going to give me the jet, the happiest flying. I stopped at a church that I was going to preach. And I said, guess what? Guess what? The pastor looked at me and said, what? This was in Opelousas, Louisiana. I said, God said he's going to give me a jet. He looked at me and said, Jesse, you can't fill up a Toyota. How you going to get a jet? He shot it down. I remember when I first got it. Guess what? I got a call. Hey, you ought to take me for a ride. I said, you will never get in that plane. Because when I needed you, I didn't ask for you no money. I needed you to believe with me. You would not. I didn't ask him any money. I said, would you like to help me on that? And there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm saying, no, I just needed his faith. I, I started out in a car and I didn't know that the Lord moved upon Jules to buy me a van. I wanted a Dodge van. This is way before the jet days. And we went to, I can't remember that Dodge place there in home. Was it Southland Dodge? He said, let's go over there. I want you to see this. I said, what you looking at? And they had purchased me a van. First one of it, brand new. Smell good. I almost got arrested three or four times in that van. I got so excited going to Lafayette that I was swerving all over I-10. I had my hand in Jesus. I can't think. This tree's coming back. I, I got a van in Jesus. And a state trooper pulled me over. And when he pulled me over, the lights go, I jumped out the car, which made him very nervous. Out the van. And I said, I'm sorry. God's in my van. He looked at me. He said, who's in the van? I said, God's in my van. He said, well, slow down. You're going to kill God. <laughs> That's a true story. I'm crying. He looked at me. He said, well, I said, my brother and my sister, they bought me a van. So I'm in the ministry. I got a van that I can preach the gospel. Calm down, young man. Calm down. I said, look in the van. No, no, I don't, I don't want to look in the van. <laughs> then I said, do you know Jesus? He said, you have a nice day. <laughs> he left me on the side of I-10. Behold, this dreamer cometh. I don't doubt. He said, I met a kid today. He didn't, he forgot. He, he could have gave me a ticket and should have. I was so excited. It was a great day. I had carpet put in it. Remember that? It was so wonderful. And, and then I decided I could use it. <laughs> yeah, it was tangerine. <laughs> you couldn't fall asleep in this van. <laughs> and I, I said, I was so excited. I said, we're going on to Destin Beach, Florida. We're going on vacation. And all the kids, now Little Jews, now the head of my television. We call him Little Jews. That's Big Jews. Make long story. They all got in it. So Jules sat. We only had two seats in the van. Because I needed for car. So I had Ka Deborah and Kathy and Julie and Ryan. Was Ryan with us? He wasn't born then. But Ryan and Jules. And they loved going on vacation with Uncle Jesse because I believed in spending every bit of money I had, which wasn't much. But I said, we on vacation. So we wouldn't get two minutes out of time. We were buying ice cream. By the time we got to Destin, them kids had a sugar high. Oh. Anyway, we didn't care. We just going crazy. But I forgot that when you swerved the van, I was throwing them from side to side. And ba bam, bam. <laughs> no seat. And they had two launcher. And I'd go, ha, <laughs> ha. 
And all of a sudden, wham, Kathy fly up against the wall. But it was tangerine carpet. They were not hurt. We stopped in Pensacola. I love catfish with raw onions. You know them long raw onions? I eat them things, but they don't like me. Boy, I heard my stomach. I started burping in the van. It was killing everybody in the back. I could hear Deborah go, oh, God. I said, it's the winds of doctrine. I got a van. My dream came to pass. It's a great day. It's a great day. It's a great day to get that jet. Oh, that television truck. I told Jerry Zavell one day I'm going to have a television truck. He said, I'll believe with you. I said, thank you. Boy, did we believe a long time for that truck. But I could just see it. I'm going to have a television truck. I'm going to be able to film a meeting for once in my life. And I don't forget when I went down there, I said, give me the truck. It was all for his work. And then the people that I began to buy the equipment, that's what they said about me. I tell you what, that man come, he know what he want. He's going to get it. Sometime I'd go in and I said, I can't, I don't have the money for this, but I promise you I'll be back here in the very near future and I'll get the whole thing that I need. It was for the work of the ministry. Let me say it again. You are not receiving according to how fast God can do things. You're receiving according to your faith. 36 and 100 fold and a thousand times comes easily to me, Herbert. I don't mean that in a prideful thing. I have to watch what I say because I get it. Because my faith claims it, grabs it. When I start to dream it, bam, faith reaches up, grabs my dream, pulls it, and turns it into a physical manifestation for me. And I think, my God, I got to start believing for something else. You know, whatever that may be, spiritually, physically, financially, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. And it's so exciting to see that. And I've had some unbelievable, impossible, quote, challenges. I'm talking multiple millions of dollars come at you at one time. What are you going to do? Nothing. Nothing. That's not my job. My job is to believe it. Because when you try to do God's job, it's called delay. You're trying to figure out how you get this to work. How can I manifest this in my life? I understand that. That's a normal reaction. But I found out that I could move God. How do I know? Genesis chapter 11. You go to Genesis chapter 11, you won't find one saved person, one godly person in the whole chapter right there. And the head of the whole city is a guy named Nimrod. I mean, this is Sin City, USA, buddy. But you know what? They had a dream. Word of God wasn't wrote yet. They weren't concerned about God. He said, come, let us come together. Watch this. These are sinners. I mean, rot gut sinners. Let's make a name for ourselves. Let's build us a tower. They got together and shared the same dream. See, this works for sinners too. This works for anybody on the planet Earth. This will work for a gorilla if you can think it. It got God's attention. God came down to see the city, the tower which man built it. Now, let me ask you a question. How come we've never found the ruins of that tower? We found everything else. Why haven't we found the ruins of that tower? You know why? Because it was not physically built. He's, they had imagined to do it. He saw their faith in their imagination. He said, if I don't stop this, they're going to do this. See, they were like architects. Once an architect draws the blueprints for your house, as far as that architect is concerned, that house is built. Even though there ain't one piece of lumber out on that lot. That house is built. Now, you mean to tell me that this heathen world can move God sovereignly and you can't? You mean to tell me you can't get God's attention when Nimrod and all them bunch of heathens could get God to walk off his throne, come down there and look at what they were imagining and believing for. And you mean to tell me you can't get God to heal your body? 
get you out of debt and you know the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. You got the nine fruits of the, the nine gifts, the fullness of the God headed bodily. Genesis, the, complete, the whole, a full revelation of the word of God. And you can't move God. When heathens can move God, if a heathen can move God sovereignly, I know you as a believer can move God because you've got the word of God to move him. And the faith that you have in your own self, your dream will move God. Go read Genesis chapter 11. And God said, we got to confuse them. He said, wherever there's confusion, there's disorder. He confused their languages. See, once you quit talking, or if you can't understand each other, nothing gets done. That's why if you don't understand, if you don't see tomorrow, until you see tomorrow, you'll never understand today. You see, what happened was God got off the throne. Brian, God got off the throne and went down there and saw what these people would do it. Well, let me help you, ladies and gentlemen, this complete complex. God got off his throne, throne and came to Destrahan, Louisiana and walked with me on this property in the wet grass, this high, about the middle of my thigh, in my pajamas at three o'clock in the morning. With the police looking at me outside of armor, and I'm walking, I said, what would you have me to do? And in those cats that tried to get rid of the pajamas for years, they had no elastic. So I had to hold them, you know, because if you turn them loose, they just fall down, you know. And I just hold them. I'm walking in that grass. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. I moved God to come down and see what I would do. That's when he said, we will never discuss it further. And just to the planet's international headquarters began to come into fruition. The dream. How many times I had a, one, a pilot named Jack and he'd be bringing me home in your citation and we'd get in front of this one. There was nothing but grass here and trees. I say, stop, Jack. He go, what's the matter, boy? Stop. And I'd get out the car, be two o'clock in the morning. I said, Jack, can you see it? Look, Jack. He said, what? I said, can you see it? Look at the buildings, Jack. Can you see, you, you see over there? That's, that's Covenant Church. That's that church. There's, there, there, there. Look, Jack. Look, 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 Jack. He go, I can't see it. And I knew right then and there that he couldn't come with me in my dream. Nice guy. Don't misunderstand me. But he couldn't walk with me in my dream. Because I wanted people to say that about him as well as they're saying it about me. Can you see the dream? When it's in faith. My God. I don't know how many times. Jack, come on. I wanted him to be with me. I wanted him. But he couldn't walk with me. That's why some partners can't stay with you. It's not because they dislike you. They can't see your dream. You thought they could. That's why sometimes some people leave your church. Because they can't see it. And I'll tell you something. God is not going to bring, have your dream encompassed about with a bunch of unbelievers. He wants some people to do what you got to do. Make this work. Let's go for it. You see, and it's not that they dislike you. Sometimes they can't figure it out neither. So they use the spiritual thing. The Lord's moving me to another church. <laughs> Let me help you. Here's a word. Go. <laughs> go. Because you're hindering the dream. And you can't receive how fast God, God wants to do this yesterday. I'm going to say this in close. I'm going to deal with part two tomorrow morning. I remember telling Jody, my daughter, she's now 43 years old. What a wonderful person. My greatest miracle was Jody. I bought her her first pretty dress at Arlington Memorial Hospital. She's the only Cajun that was born in Texas in my family. And I went out and bought a dress for her. And that nurse said, hey, man. How can that freaky, hippie-looking rock dude have such nice taste on clothes? Well, I know when a baby look pretty. I probably said, I want my baby, when she come out, to look good. And she was dressed. And Kathy and, Kathy and I, we brought her out of the hospital. And watch this. I put a dream in her. I said, Jody, listen to your daddy. And she'd go, if you know the Jody, she got very expressive eyes. 
I know it's Jody here tonight. I don't know if she is. She, may, she, she might be taking care of Meredith. Make a long story short. I said, when you get as tall as your mama, daddy going to buy you a brand new car. A red one. A red one. I would tell her that at five, six, seven, eight, nine. All of a sudden, I saw a spurt coming. I said, she's going to be tall as her mama when she's 11. I don't care. I'm buying the car. If we got to have a drive out in the pasture somewhere, she's getting the car. But thank God, the spurt stopped. Just, and when she got out of my hopes, I couldn't stand it any longer. It was driving me crazy. He said, I'm the father wanting to bless my child. You know, God is saying to you, come on. Come on. Grow, grow, grow. Come on. And finally at 14 and a half, I said, I can't stand it, Kathy. And I went to the new dealership and bought her the car. Kathy said she can't get a license. She can only get a learner's permit. I said, well, drive with her, Kathy. Drive with her. She's going to get that car. It was such, what's the word? Such manifestation on my part. I, I've had God say, please let me do it. Come, Jesse, grow that I can put this in your hand. It was like, and of course she got the car. She went crazy and enjoyed it. And then I couldn't help it. When she was 16, I bought her another one. And I brought her out. She was, by that time, had a job <laughs> at the mall there, Esplanade Mall. And I said, where'd you park your car? She already had taken a car and traded it all, got her another one. She came out. She goes, daddy, somebody stole my car. I said, well, where did you park it? She said, right here where this blue car is. I said, well, you, no, you couldn't have parked. Dad, I'm telling you, they stole my car. I said, well, maybe this is new keys to a new car. Oh, daddy. It was a great day. Not just for her, but for me. Do you realize how happy God gets when you get your dreams? He's just on the throne go, <laughs> Look at my kid. Well, now married as a seven. I said, what is grandfather going to do when you get as tall as your mom? She goes, buy me a brand new red car. She said, but I changed my mind. I think I want a blue one. I said, fine. I said, anything else? She says, I'll think about it. <laughs> and every time I see her, we got something on the wall at the house. How much did you grow today, Meredith? We measuring her, boy. I can't wait till I do that for my granddaughter. It's going to be a great day. And I'm believing God to have full capability and capacity that her child I can see grow to a teenager. And I'd be 95, 97, and then I can buy my great granddaughter. Why not? I'm dreaming it. See, people say, He's so blessed. But I receive according to my faith. Not, a, not that I got more than you, but I may exercise it more. That's all you got to do is exercise it. To get it to function and work. That's what I want the, them to say about me. Now, we got Ron Kardashian here tonight. Part of the Kardashian. Lift your hand up, Ron, so everybody see. This is part of the Kardashian. You know, you know what's the girl name with the big butt? What's her name? Kim. Kim Kardashian. You already know about it, so I don't know why you're freaking out over it. And, and that butt's made a lot of money for her. That's okay with me. That ain't none of my business. But I've talked to Ron several times on the phone. I hear his dreams and his aspirations. It's exciting. Why? Because they God sent. God called. And will God manifest? So if you're walking around town and somebody says, mm, behold, that dreamer cometh, you ought to smile and say, thank you. You made my day today. I'll say one more thing and I'll close one time in the restaurant. The guy said, 
That's a preacher over there got a jet. Everybody just looked and I jumped. I said, ain't it great? <laughs> it is so wonderful. How many of y'all would love to have a jet? And people went. I said, it's great. You don't have to stand in line. You don't have to take your shoes off. You don't have to go through an x-ray to show what you got. You just walk on the plane. And they say, Falcon 770, Juliet Delta, we release you for takeoff. Go off on runway 12A or 2A1, whatever. Thank you. And all you hear is this. And the other day, every once in a while, my, my, my pilot's kind of like to show off a little bit. We was in this little town. It was a blessing. And they saw some children that came out to the airport to see Brother Jesse playing. And my God, we ain't never took off that fast that I can remember in my whole lifetime. <laughs> so they want to show these kids what this Falcon could do, baby. So boy, 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 I mean, I thought, my God, he's already at full speed. He's only been he, about 1,800 feet. And all of a sudden, that, I mean, he put that plane on its butt. Bam. Saw <laughs> straight up. And I went up there. I'm trying to get, I said, is there something wrong? No, there's kids. We just want to show them how fast this baby cooks. <laughs> I mean, it, and we were gone. But you got to have pilots that know when things are not, when there's challenges, can you handle it? One more story, in Goose Bay, Newfoundland. I ain't never seen that kind of weather of snow. And they said, Falcon 770, Julia Delta, if you don't leave, you're going to be shut down for the next eight days. They will shut this airport down, shut it down. And boy, I could see it coming like a tsunami rolling boy it was coming i looked like that and that kathy goes we're taking off in that i said yeah i said we we just got 20 seconds and we got to move and kathy said well, i think i'm gonna pray in tongues i said that, that, that's a good idea <laughs> not that we're doing something dangerous but buddy if you're gonna move you gotta move and i heard my my pilots look at each other and they said we will not abort we will not abort and they said okay we won't abort when they hit that throb, man, I mean, it was immediate. And you can see maybe from me to where Pastor Nate is. And, ain't no, and you can't see no more runway. It's rolling in. Buddy, I want to tell you something. And a jet engine loves cold air. Heavy air because it grabs it. And I know they can't see. Their heads are in the instrumentation. There's Kathy. And I'm thinking, we will not abort. Oh, God, let's never abort. Show we took off. I mean, they put, pulled that tail, that nose up. And the Lord said, look, look up, look up, watch. Boy, and there's nothing but snow coming. All of a sudden, boom, beautiful blue. We saw the sky. And I walked up. I said, boys, y'all did a job. And they said, that's why you pay us the big bucks. It was a great day. Flew all the way to New Orleans. See, we left the cloud there. There are going to be some times when you dream and you're on the runway. You better have some people that got enough guts to say, we will not abort. We're not doing something vain, but we will not abort. We're going to complete this mission and fulfill it. Boy, I, then we told when we they call it breaking out. When they, we broke out in them beautiful blue clouds, so I, I said, Lord, gee. She said, Jesse, my prayer works, don't it? I said, it sure does, mama. Lord Jesus. I said, was you scared? She said, no, I'm scared as the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. I said, but what was that trembling with your leg? Like? Was that the Holy Ghost on your leg? Well, that's a little fear, but I mean, she said, but up here, it was <laughs> blue sky. Ladies and gentlemen, we will not abort. I say this, don't abort your dream. Because you're about ready to break out into the blue sky. Give the Lord a great God bless you. Oh, come on. Give him a great God bless you. Woo, glory.
And we'll deal with tomorrow real quickly. Dreamers have ideals and always attain something no matter how much they stumble or fall. Dreamers have a sense of responsibility that leads to a direct accountability to God. Dreamers have the genius to be loved greatly because they have the genius to love greatly. You don't want to miss tomorrow morning if you can. If you can't, I hope you can maybe get some of the material and God will bless you. I want everybody saying that about you. This is the beginning. I really believe this, ladies and gentlemen. You don't abort. The engines are at full speed. We're moving ahead. Now, to stay in the seat, you got to lock yourself down. Because the G-forces are coming. But there's just something about it. And you know when you manifest it is when you land, you see that guy like this. Boom, you pull them throttles down. You walk out and there's people waiting on you. Yes, sir. Can we help you? Yes. Is my car ready? Yes, it's right here. Anything else we can do for you? You need ice. You need to take the garbage off your plane. Do you need facilities taken care of? I said, talk to my pilots. Where's my car? They're waiting for you right here. Thank you. I'll see you tonight. And when I walk back out, I look at them pilots and say, did you tip them guys? Did you bless them? Uh, bless them good. They really helped us. And they, they just stand in there and we go, here. They go, they go. You come back anytime you want, sir. You ask for my name. And I promise you. I said, well, something, we may be a little late tonight. It don't make no difference. How late y'all? We'll wait on you. I love when Leroy Thompson gets off his plane. He got that walk. And I'm right behind him, following Mr. Leroy. Come on. It's great, man. It's not showing off. Because the dream is now physical manifestation. And that moves people to never abort, to get the next one, to get the dream that they're believing for. And it will come to pass. Stand to your feet and give God a standing ovation tonight. Come on. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Come on. Give him a good one. What a blessing. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. What a blessing. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in just a minute. I think pastor's going to come up and say, Where is it? am I correcting that? And uh, God... I tell you what I believe in God for. By tomorrow night, somebody's going to come up to me and say, Brother Jesse, my dream came to pass today. It manifested today. Because we wouldn't abort. It's amazing. Oh, some of you going home and uh, miracles will be awaiting you when you get there. God's been on assignment for you. <laughs> oh, Jesus. There's a couple here, when you get home, your boy will be home in the next two weeks with a totally changed mind. It is the beginning. And it will work for you. Not some of the time, but all the time. And if you don't have a dream, invent one. Just go sit in a nursery and watch children play and how they imagine things. Ah, God. And it'll cause you to imagine, and it'll get God off his throne. He'll come down to see what you imagine it. And boy, if you imagine the right thing, he'll get involved in your dream. And then I'll close with this statement, Pastor, come on up here. He'll ask you something so powerful that it makes you tremble. He'll look at you and say, command ye me. Concerning my word. What would you have me to do? <sighs> That's big, ladies and gentlemen. When God Almighty will say, command ye me. He ain't saying ask. I caught it in my word. Now, you better know the word of God. It ain't snapping your fingers at God, but no means. But when he sees that you have that in you, not to abort, he'll say, command me. <sighs> 
That's what old Roberts did. He commanded me to pray for his shoulder. I command you in the name of Jesus to put your hands on me. Don't let me hurt any longer. I'll never forget that as long as I ever live in my life. And man, I wasn't worthy to stand in his presence as far as I was concerned. But he saw something I didn't see. That is the, I mean, when you do that, then son, you get ready. Because <sighs> it'll flow to you so big and so strong. Spiritually, physically, financially. That you'll literally have to sit down and go pray about what to do with all the things that God is placing in your hands. So you make the right decisions. You enjoyed it tonight? Yeah. Give Jesus a hand clap as pastor comes. In my sermon I preached last night, part one was, I hope they say that about me, that when Joseph was walking up to his brothers, they said, mm, behold, that dreamer cometh. I hope they say that about you. Behold, that dreamer cometh. Because you see, you hold the destiny of planet Earth in your hands with the dream that God has placed in you. And dreams have no expiration dates. You can get them at nine or you can get them at 90. So in Exodus, excuse me, Genesis chapter 37, verse 19, that one simple statement about Joseph's character, behold, that dreamer cometh. I preached last night that until you see tomorrow, you will never understand today. The reason why so many people are confused today because they've never looked in the future so they could understand what was happening to him at that particular time of the day. I told you, you were created to be sustained by having a vision of something bigger than just today. I'm saying this because many of you were taking notes last night. I told you vision requires faith and it also makes life more enjoyable. People say that man enjoys life. Well, it's my, it's my vision that requires faith. It makes it enjoyable. I told you dreams and visions keep you prepared. Satan can't sneak up on you because you are ahead of him all the time. Why? Because you see, he can't dream like you dream and see like you see. He's restricted and rejected in awaiting confinement. I, I spoke a little bit about, about this part. When you know what you are pursuing and when you know what is coming, your days become faster and easier. Because, see, when you're told to go to church, get ready for the hard time. They're always talking about the hard time. And the Lord, Lord. Remember the good old testimony days? Anybody got a good testimony? Watch it. How many times you heard it? Anybody got a good testimony? Somebody get up and say, the devil been beating my brains out all we long. Sit your ugly self down. We don't want no bad testimony. We'd like to hear a good one. But, say they equate badness as goodness. They equate persecution as love. Like some women equate a man beating them that he loves her. No, if you have a husband like that, come to Louisiana. We'll show you how to take care of that. <laughs> Alligators got to eat. <laughs> that ain't from God, but that sure sounds like Jesse. Let me just say that. <laughs> Don't let nobody be beating on you. You're not somebody, you know, somebody's, you know. I told you last night, you're not receiving according how fast God can do things. You're receiving according to your faith. In Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, be it unto you. You see, so people ask me all the time, man, how come you get your prayers answered so fast? Now, some get delayed, but not denied. Because Satan can hinder, but not stop. But that don't make me, I just keep heaping, heaping faith on it, see? Keep heaping faith. See, faith will never stop for me. I had one man say, you know, the word of faith movement is over. Said, it's not a movement, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It can never be over. The only way you're going to please God is through faith. So I want to start this morning with this point and write it down. Dreamers, how many of y'all dreamers? Yeah. Have ideals and always attain something. No matter how much they stumble. And fall in their progress. Just because you stumble and fall doesn't mean your dream is wrong. You just might be a little clumsy. Like Joseph was, you don't tell an older brother that he's going to worship you. You don't tell a patriarch, Jacob, that he's going to bow down to you, even though that all came to pass. He stumbled on that. Because he knew he was well loved. Let me say it again. Dreamers have ideals and always attain something, no matter how much they stumble and fall in their progress. There's been many times I've stumbled and fall, fell, but I got up. 
Michael, Michael 7 says, when I fall, I shall arise. And I realize, and I've learned it, and you might want to do this. Don't look for the person that helped you the last time you stumbled to help you again. Because they may not be there, and they may be there. In other words, get up on your own power. Get up on your own power. Because you see, you're not a failure. A failure is someone that doesn't start. A failure is somebody that just quits, like the parable of the talents. Five talent, two talent, one talent. Now the guy with the two talents only had one talent more than the guy with the one talent. Just one more. That wasn't that much. But the guy with the one talent, he operates in fear and buries it because I heard you was a hard man. A man wasn't a hard man. He was just a businessman. And I've learned something. People say, why do you deal so much with business? Because I learned it from Jesus at 12 years old when he told his mama, I'm about my father's business. You notice he didn't say I'm about my father's ministry. The temple had become a business to these people. That's why when he came back, he threw over all that, all that money and stuff. Not that it was against money or that they were selling something. It was the idea that they had turned the place into it. He said, and you know what? The, the sages and those great rabbis were so impressed by Jesus. It was not his understanding of scripture like most people preach, even though that is true. He was his understanding of business. At a 12-year-old boy, let me tell you how to run this temple. Yeah. And they were shocked at the business savvy of Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? So when you incorporate those two, because God never goes against business principles. He's Jewish. <laughs> Jewish people usually are very successful simply because God has given that great gift to them. But they're also business savvy. Yes. Do you understand? And you must be. And I've learned something about God. He does not go against business principles. He, he aligns himself with how people do things. Now, sometimes he'll jump over something because somebody's dragging their feet. But he's very business minded and orientated in everything that he does. So dreamers have ideals and always attain something no matter how much they stumble and fall in their progress. I remember that I wanted to be a blessing to my mother. We were very poor. Some of you have heard me say this. I begin to think. Because I used to see my mom go out there. We used to hang clothes on a line. Anybody ever did that? And I know I'm talking back. Most people don't even know what I'm talking about. You would wash your clothes. Do you remember the washboards? And do you remember that kind of washing machine? Yeah. That, that ring, that thing? And if it caught you, yeah. it sucked you in there and beat your brains out. <laughs> remember them things? Well, in South Louisiana, especially in the spring... There's billions and billions of, if we hadn't had a cold weather, to kill those mosquito eggs. And I'd see a blood run down my mama's legs when the mosquitoes biting her. And she would have to take the clothes off the line and all that kind of stuff. This is when you can hang out clothes and it came back so fresh. That ain't no more. Because the environment is not what it was back then. We used to drink water out of a cistern. We used to catch the water. Anybody know what a, does anybody know what I'm talking about? A cistern used to catch water. Run your gutter in there. It was the good rain water, Lord Jesus. Today, if you drink that, you die. <laughs> well, I remember as a small boy, we heard of an automatic washer and dryer. I must have been, I don't know, eight. And I used to cut grass to make me a few dollars. And it took a lot of grass to make a few dollars. They, they'd make you cut a yard for 50 cents an acre. <laughs> you know. My God, man. So I made up my mind that I would buy my mother a washer machine and a dryer. So I start cutting grass. Now, during that time, I stumbled sometimes and I fell, but I kept saving my money till one day. And that day came, which was about two years later. I walked into Sears. It wasn't Sears then. It was Sears and Roebuck. Anybody remember that? Sears and Roebuck. Whatever happened to Roebuck? <laughs> I don't know. And I walked in and went into the appliance section. Now, I'm a child. I was eight. I'm about 10, 10 and a half, something like that. He said, can I help you, little fella? I said, yes, sir. I want to buy a washer and a dryer. He said, you want to buy a washer and a dryer? I said, yeah, for my mama. He said, well, where's your daddy? I said, he ain't here. <laughs> We're doing business together. He just looked at me like this. I was short in them days. 
Y'all caught that, did you? Now I'm five foot 16 inches, but I mean, then, you know. <laughs> I said, just write up the contract. I said, how much? Now watch this. A washing machine was $45. And a dryer was $55. If you wanted the one that gas. I said, that's what we'll take. He said, you got that kind of money? I said, write the contract up. I'm going to pay you cash. I've been cutting grass. It's a little green, this money. But it's real money. I want you to deliver it to 123 Juanita Street on the Coteau Road. You got it? Yes, sir. I said, you ring it. And the, the person that's living there is a person named Velma Duplantis. He says, that's your mama? I said, I would never spend that much money with any other woman in my life. <laughs> until I met Kathy. And she told, we bought Whirlpool. No, no, <laughs> it was more than just a wash and a dry. He said, okay, you got the money. He worked, I said, I got the money. So I pulled the money out and I paid him. He said, would you like a warranty on it? I said, well, is it going to break? <laughs> well, no, Sears and Burbuck make good stuff. I said, well, do I need a warranty? He said, well, you got automatically got a warranty. I said, well, when that one runs out, just give us a call. Okay. So here we go. Man, I went home. He said it'll be delivered tomorrow afternoon, at, you know, between one and five. It was my dream. I had told my brother, I said, I'm going to do this. He said, hey, you can't do Shut up, boy. Sears and Roebuck truck pulled up. I was there at the house waiting. We lived in a mobile home. We had to move frequently because of bills. See, because creditors have greater, me greater memories than depositors. <laughs> Got that revelation? <laughs> so the man comes out there and he goes, knocks on the door. Now I'm in the back. You know, it's a uh, two bedroom trailer. My mom opened this. Can I help you? He said, are you Velma the Planners? Yes, this is 123 Juanita Street, Coteau Road. Yes, sir. He, she said, ma'am, he said, we came to deliver your washer and dryer. Mom said, what'd you say? <laughs> your washer and dryer. You got a washer and dryer for me? Yes, sir. Is your name Velma the Planners? Yes. He said, yes, it's paid for. And we, and it's all, we all paid to hook it up, which was an extra $10. That's how they did that in those days. So she looked, my daddy was sitting on a recliner. She said, Paul, did you buy me a washer and a dryer? That, can I say it like my daddy said it? <laughs> Hell no, I ain't bought no washer. <laughs> he said, I can't afford that. He said, I would love to, but I can't do that. She said, sir, you've got the wrong address. He said, ma'am, is this 123 Juanita Street, the Coto Road? Yes. Is your name Velma DePlanis? Yes. This is your washer and your dryer, and it's paid for. And we, it takes us about 20 minutes to hook it all up and ready to go. She said, well, who bought it? He said, well, let me see. Yeah, two or three pages, you know. Somebody named Jesse the Planners. She said, who? <laughs> Jesse Duplantis. Jess, she said, Je Jesse! <laughs> I know what she was thinking. It fell off the truck. He stole it. <laughs> I was a sinner even at that age, pretty strong. I was in the back. Jesse! Come out here! Did you buy me a washer and a dryer? And I went, hell yes. <laughs> if daddy could say it, Jesse could say it. <laughs> How did you pay for that? I said, all them yards I've been cutting for two years. Do you like it, mama? Do I like it? Said the mosquitoes won't bite you no more, mama. Ooh. It was a great day. 
You see, dreamers have a sense of responsibility that leads to a direct accountableness to God. When I took on that dream, I had a responsibility. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm back in the past. I had a sense of responsibility to that dream. And I was accountable to God for it. So I'm proud when they say, behold, this dreamer cometh. Because that shows that I could be at any age, at any time, accountable to God Almighty. That the dream would be fulfilled. Let me say it again. Dreamers have a sense of responsibility that leads to a direct accountableness to God. There was times I stumbled in the cutting of the grass. But that didn't stop the dream. She said, I never thought in my entire life my kid would buy it. How, son? And my daddy looked at me and said, how'd you do it, boy? I said, work, daddy. You know, something you told us to do all the time. I'm proud of you, boy. That saved me from buying something like that. <laughs> Am I telling you, that's how my daddy was. It wasn't that he didn't. He just, he just did the way he was. She said, I'm going to make your favorite meal tonight, Jesse. I said, spaghetti and meatballs, mama. The big meatballs. She said, as big as your fist. It was a great day. I had learned to dream and bring dreams to pass. And the main ingredient of that dream was the working of that dream. And I was accountable to it the minute I accepted it by faith. I had to accept it by faith because I certainly didn't have the money. That was a lot of money for a ten and a half year old boy way back when. I hadn't got that job yet, see. I guess that's probably what that God put that idea. Oh, my daddy got that idea. I can get that boy a job and he can pay me some rent. Which many may not realize, I started paying rent to my dad when I was 11, about 11 and a half years old. Got me a job. Well, 11 years old at the grocery store. Been paying it. I mean, that's the way it was. Not that he was a mean man. That just was his generation. He's just the way you do things. But see, once I took upon that dream, once Joseph spoke those dreams, he had a responsibility to it. What is your dream? What's in your wallet? What is your dream? Because you have an accountable, you have an account, account that, that you're going to account to God for that. Because he says, you can do this. And that accountableness makes God happy and the people that are involved in the dream. And let me just say this. When you begin to do things like that, people fall in love with you. Which brings me to this. Dreamers have the genius to be loved greatly. People love Joseph. Everywhere he went, he had favor. Now, some people misinterpret the love and try to make it sexual, which is Potiphar's house. Wife does that. But he is such a man of character as a young man. And now, he's not very smart. You don't run out of a woman's house naked saying, I didn't do nothing. Because <laughs> you're going down, Jack, you understand? <laughs> and he ran. But his mind was, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? He called him my God, which means there was something personal there between God Almighty and this kid. And everywhere he went, he was greatly loved. And when people greatly love you, they trust you. Let me say it again. Dreamers have the genius to be loved greatly. Why? Because they have the genius to love greatly. They transfer love to love. Genius to love greatly in every area. I've had many of my staff say, Bob, they all call me boss here. They say, boss, you don't realize how many people love you. My God, man. I mean, people calling in all the time. They just love you. I said, I'm lovable. I'm not being, I'm bragging about that. Why? Why not? It's better than somebody hating you. So let me say again, dreamers have, write it down, the genius to be loved greatly because they have the genius to love greatly. 
And you know the story of Joseph. He goes from the prison man to the prime minister of Egypt. Why? Why? All incorporated in dreams. You know, this crazy fairy tale stuff that people say that all that is. Well, why? He, he was sent to preserve the nation of Israel. And in the midst of it, preserve the heathen Pharaoh. And made Pharaoh richer than he ever been beside himself being blessed. And when he had the chance to strike back to them lazy, no comp puppy dog brothers he had. He didn't. But he had to. He gave us enough. He said, I'm not that good. He said this. The Lord has caused me or made me to forget. See, sometimes people hurt you so bad that it only takes God. To make you forget. Which brings me to this point. We must reverence the ties God has placed amongst us. Never make an enemy without a very good reason. Because you have to reverence the ties God has placed amongst us. You don't make an enemy. Now, sometimes enemies are made when the bridge starts burning and you don't know how the bridge started to burn. You know that. That's just common sense. But even in that, the Bible said, if you'll operate right, he said he'll make your enemies to be at peace with you. He didn't say he would make them your friends. But he said they would be at peace with you. Because you were accountable to that dream. And you know the story of Joseph. Not only did his dream come to pass. See, you got to have the guts to interpret the dream correctly. Because he's in prison, he gets two dreams and he interprets them. One's good and one's bad. But he did not hesitate to tell the interpretation of, quote, quote, the bad one. In two or three days, your head's going to be, he's going to be hung or get, get it cut off and they, well, all this kind of stuff. Now, the bad part about this, when you make a dream come to pass for some people, they forget you. Because they got what they wanted. And all Joseph asked, just remember me. But you see, if they don't, God does. Because then Pharaoh had a disturbing dream. And all these hot shots could not interpret anything. Wait, if you tell us the dream. No, you tell me the dream. Ah, all of a sudden, this guy goes, I know a guy. Now, I want you to listen to this. When you go before great men and women, the Bible said you don't go look at me like this. Which is not bad. But you don't go like this. If the president of the United States calls me, I'm not going like this. And I'm, I'm not going to walk and say, what's up, Barack? <laughs> I'm going to say, Mr. President. Now, I don't agree with his policies in a lot of areas. That don't, that don't make no difference. He's the president of the United States. The Bible said that Joseph changed his raiment. He changed his clothes. He presented himself correctly. And what came before him was not only the interpretation of the dream to Pharaoh, but the wisdom that the man had. Because dreamers, if God gives you a dream, he gives you the knowledge and the wisdom to make it come to pass. And of course, you know, the story tells the dream. And my God, he said, is there any man that, that can do this? Standing right before us. And he saves the economy of Egypt and the people and the nation of Israel. We wouldn't have any. Isn't that amazing? But he said this, I never forget where I come from. Take my bones and my body out of here. Is it possible that God showed him? slavery that would come because the next thing you hear there, there was a pharaoh who knew not joseph so it's very possible in life you will meet somebody or that would destroy someone's dream because they don't know that person and you got to know how to fix that so we must reverence the ties god has placed amongst us you never make an enemy without a very good reason now let me say this and we so we get closing here when passing through hard times anybody ever had hard times okay when passing through, it didn't say stop, build a house, and canonize the place. <laughs> Pentecostals are bad about that. They love that. Oh, Jesus, just beat me, Jesus. Beat me, Jesus. Oh, God. No, no, you don't want to do that. When passing through hard times, never become broken spirit. You never become it. Why? How's that done? It's done by determination. I determined in my life that I would be a success going somewhere to succeed. The time fact that meant nothing to me. Now, I prefer it yesterday. 
I'm an American. I believe in fast food. Get it to me, even when I go to a good restaurant. I love Nate and Michelle, but I, I didn't realize how they were into details until I went on vacation with them, until I brought them on my vacation. I got to say it, Nate. This is the funniest thing. <laughs> Kathy said, there's an Italian restaurant called Buca de Pepper. I said, Buca de what? Buca de Pepper. I said, let's go. I said, Nate, you ever heard of Buca de Pepper? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. I got it. I got it. Now, Nate is a connoisseur of coffee and all kinds of foods. He's in. He's always trying to get me to drink coconut water that tastes like trash. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't like it. He said, try this. Both, uh, now, Michelle, let me try something because she likes sweets. I'll try that. But when Nate, I go, what, what is it, Nate? <laughs> so we go to Book at the Pepper. I said, y'all order anything you want. And I'm buying. We're going to have a good time. Nate says, go song. Guy comes in. He said, we want some calamari. So I'm thinking, okay. He said, now I would like to know, when the calamari is brought here, what percentage of it has legs on it? <laughs> and what percentage doesn't have the legs? You know what I'm talking about, VV calamari. Is it 40%? Is it 60%? Is it 70%? The guy's thinking. He wanted, he wanted more legs. He liked his stuff. And you can see the waiter. What's wrong with this fool? <laughs> this is an Italian restaurant. We got a mob table in the kitchen. You want to go there? <laughs> is it six, four percent? Six, I mean, he is strong on that. The guy going, well, I, I think it's 70. What did he say? 70? I can't remember that. 70% or something? 80%. 80%. <laughs> and then Nate said, well, but that's what we want. Bring it on, son. Yes, sir. He go back there. Here comes the calamari. He, all of a sudden, here comes the detail. He goes. <laughs> he goes, there was only two that had legs. He says, Garasa. I'm thinking, I hope nobody knows me in this restaurant, for God's sake. He said, is this 40%? Is this 80%? What do you think? Do you think that's 80%? Or do you think it's 60%? How about 40%? How about 8%? I thought this guy's going to take this calamari and jam it in Nate's face. I said, well, we'll, we'll eat it. Glory to God. I can see it in there. I said, give the, give the one with the legs to Nate. And then he gets real humble. Oh, no, boss, it's yours. No, I ain't touching them legs. That ain't my leg. Uh -uh. And then, I don't know if it was Michelle or somebody said, they got great desserts here. Now, I'm not a big dessert eater, but Michelle liked desserts. I mean, the Holy Ghost come up on Michelle. When you say you want some cheesecake, she can be like this. Because, see, she's married to Nate, and, and they're drinking coconut water. All that trash, you know what I'm saying? All that junk. Like one time she says, I'll have a Diet Coke. Michelle, don't put that poison in your body. I went, whoa, Nate. Whoa, Nate. Okay. Don't put the poison in your body. And she goes, you can see it going. Okay. They say, you order dessert. I am not exaggerating. Am I? Is that dessert that big? Yeah. It comes in this big glass. It's, what do you call it? Is that a Sunday? I guess you could. Yeah, Something like this big. But it was a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It was a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Kathy. That's good. You're doing good. Man. Go God. <laughs> Give Kathy a hand clap. She's something good, something like that. Glory to God. <laughs> I am not exaggerating. It is this big pack. The, uh, uh, it's that big <laughs> and they got hot fudge and everything you can think of now there's Michelle <laughs> bring us spoons man this thing is so big the spoon we were it was like sword fighting <laughs> you could hear the spoons clicking <laughs> you know, it's no way you're gonna eat all four of us ain't no way we could even eat half of this thing 
Now, when you get something like that, everybody in the restaurant go, boy, look at that over there. I wanted to say, Nate, the Sunday is the chocolate 30% or 40%. Well, we ate, I don't think we ate half of it. I, I think it's just that big. And we are full. I mean, we're taking big bites, you know. And I noticed Michelle, she'd eat, she'd just take a little bit. Michelle's kind of slick, you know. And when Nate would look, <laughs> 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 now I could hear him say, don't put that poison in your body. You know? <laughs> it was great. I said, there ain't no way we can eat this. Now they got this. These people sitting next to us on this side. I said, yo, excuse me. I grabbed that thing and I got out of my chair and I walked over to the table. I said, hi. Boom. I said, we have no diseases. We are healed. Ain't no use throwing us all the way. I said, would you like this? And and one lady said, yes. I said, y'all got your spoons. And they started, boy. And they started. And they couldn't eat it all. I'm telling you, this is the biggest dessert I've ever seen in my life. Well, they got up and left. And I thought, I got to really tip this guy. Because Nate's 40%, 50%, 70%. Now, Nate was looking for 80%. So I said, I'm going to give this guy 80% tip, I think. So I come up there and he goes, he gives me a bill. And I said, I paid the bill. And I said, here's $100 for you. Oh, I could see Nate going... It wasn't 80%, but it wasn't 80%. Oh, no. <laughs> so he go tell all the other waiters, God gave me a hundred bucks. Mister, I can't thank you enough. He was wanting to do something. Go with his, visit, his family. visit his family for something. I can't remember. That. I said, well, you can go now and enjoy yourself. That'd be a blessing. That's good, you know. Now, wait, you don't need to pour so much. I said, all of a sudden, the two waiters that were waiting on the people that I gave the dessert to come back and say, excuse me, sir, his, uh, these people gave you some money. I went, no, no, I don't want no money. I just wanted them to eat the dessert. I forgot what they gave. Was it $20? Yeah, it was $20 and a note. That said $20. And thank you for doing it. It was so kind of you to do that. So I saw that $20. I said, well, I said, sir. No, I don't want that. He said, hey, go on. I said, Lord, I, I just want, I'd like to just say thank. I mean, I'm just trying to be nice. So I look at these waiters. I said, well, they're not here. Would y'all like this $20? Yes. <laughs> but I could see Nate say, gave him 10%, 20%. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm giving Nate a hard time. <laughs> and now when I think of calamari, I... I I want to call Nate. I got one at 80% here, Nate. This is an 80% calamari dish. You got to come over and see this, Nate. <laughs> we were having a wonderful time. And you know what? They were gone, so we decided to go to a movie, went to a movie. We walk out, and guess who we ran into? Those people. I said, I want to say, you didn't need to give us any money. Now, I didn't tell them I gave their money to the waiter, you know. But that, that hundred dollar, that, that waiter said, anytime you come to book the pepper, you ask for me. You understand? You ask for me. Yeah. I said, even with him? <laughs> yes, even with him. We will talk to you. <laughs> we had a good day. Well, I, I said all that, but I don't know why I said all that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, I said all that. Yes. But that ain't my point. Never making any move. That. <laughs> that ain't my point. The woman ain't even listening. That ain't my point. My point is, I made the man's dream come to pass because he wanted to go home and see his family. <laughs> you only get one good line of sermons. <laughs> So when passing through hard times, never become broken spirit. (laughs) It's done by determination. So what will you determine in this conference 
that will come to pass in your life when you leave. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, didn't he say, though I stop, build a house, canonize the place, but walk through it. Just keep going. Because you're not a, a failure because you did something. A failure is one that won't do nothing like that guy with one talent. I'm going to just let this thing sit here. Maybe get a little interest. When the guy comes back, I'll give it to him. See, he refused to take responsibility. He refused to be accountable to that person in that manner. You see what I'm saying? So Joseph stayed accountable to God and became prime minister. Isn't that something? I wonder what your next job classification is. Is it dungeon dweller or is it prime minister? Think about that for a minute. So, but Jesse, have you ever had any hard times? Well, sure. But I never thought of it as hard times. I just thought of it, if the devil would just not do these things, he doesn't realize I'm going to learn a lot through this. You know, if Satan wouldn't push people, most people go to hell by themselves. It's called complacency. And I've learned to not, let me close with this. I learned not to accept what the world around me says. One more statement. I, 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 when I was living in Homer, Louisiana, I wanted to... And it, it, the oil industry shut down. Oil went down to $6 a barrel. That was in the 80s. Anybody remember that? Boy, I mean, that, that was something. 80, six bucks. Son, if we'd have just bought it all at $6 and held it, oh, even at this 50-something dollars a barrel, you'd make a fortune on that. And I wanted to sell my house. And there were bumper stickers. So when you leave home, I take out the lights. Because everybody would just leave. I mean, you need economy because about, I guess, what, 80%? Uh, based economy in home on oil in those days. <laughs> I got 80% of my mind, Jules, you know what I'm saying? Uh, okay, let's just say there's 40% left. <laughs> so, I call a real estate, they come, they said, now, Reverend, uh, uh, how much you like to sell? I said, this is what I want for. Or oh, there's no way possible that, you, that the house will sell for that. I said, okay, you can leave. I said, I'm not going to sign with you because you have no faith. I said, let me ask you a question. Do you believe this house is worth this money? Oh, yes. Oh, it's definitely worth, it's worth more than that. It's not the issue. But you can't get that. Thank you very much. I said, now nah, I don't find somebody to tell me again what I can't do. But I had a dream that I was going to sell this bed. I said, I'm not going to sign with you because you don't have any faith. Let me help you. I'm not only going to sell this house. I'm going to bring up all the values of the house on the block. I see, because you see, my dreams go over to the next house and the next house and the next house and the next house. And I'm going to de be dealing that with tonight. In other words, just hang around with me, bless God, because your dream and my dreaming will infuse together. And before you know, we got what we want, not what we need, what we want and what we desire. Because God said we could have that. Delight yourself there from the Lord to give you the desires of your heart. Pray like the psalmist David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, they went. Phew. But I did ask the good question. Do you believe this house was worth that? Well, yes, but keep looking at the economy. You see, I create my world. You do what you want. I'm going to create my world and walk in it. That's what I do. Well, we started. And I wasn't, but what, a week and a half, two weeks later, something like that. These people want to come see the house. They come from Metairie, which is right down the road from here. They get out, the man, his wife, and his mother. She goes, oh, I love this house. <laughs> Now, they're moving from Metairie to Homer, which is a miracle in itself. Yeah. Because everybody's leaving Homer because there's not economy. And, she, and the lady, uh, the husband's wife says, you know, I just wallpapered this, my house in Metairie. I, had, I picked all my colors, done everything. I just hate to leave it because it's, it's what I've always wanted. But his job is moving here. now. I said, ma'am, when you walk in the door of this house... You are going to fall in love with a house like you ain't never fell in love with. I'm telling you, this is your dream. Now, I know what they're thinking. He just saying that, trying to sell a house. And the little, his mama said, well, let's just see. <laughs> see, older people, they're going to put you to the test. They walk in, watch this. Kathy had re-wallpapered our house. 
walked into the den. She goes, <gasps> Kathy had picked the same wallpaper that she had picked at the house in Metairie. Not just that place, every area. Like as if Kathy was a spy saying, that's who's going to, what, what's what you picking? Okay, I'm going to put that in my house when they come. I'll just snatch them. Let's go. She goes, my God. And I thought, yes. <laughs> she said, look at this, honey. And the mama goes, she's got a little cane. Well, let me tell you something, son-in-law. If you don't buy this house, I'm buying it. <laughs> they said, so. I brought all the property values up on the block. I mean, my neighbors come and say, boy, Reverend, I just thank you for that. You just made me $30,000. I said, well, I ain't finished yet. I called the real estate agent. I said, can you come over? They think I'm going to sign with them. They come running over, and right down on the sign, it says sold. And I said, I got this kind of money. Now, what, was, what is your commission? Is it 6%? You don't get nothing. Because <laughs> you didn't have a dream. You had an opportunity to dream with me, to believe with me, but you would not. And you actually told me that the house is worth that much. So your own intellect was telling you it's worth that much. But you decided to let someone who you don't know determine what you're going to receive. You may not know the, the, the feds. I don't care what they say. I'm not going to let them determine what I receive. My accounting comes from a 30, 60, 100, 4,000 time El Shaddai. Jehovah Shira, Jehovah Sid Canoe. I'm talking to God that got to have so many names just to encompass who he is. Excuse me, uh, people watching, by, my wife is talking to me right now. What? You got to say it on the microphone, woman. Go ahead. When the people went to the bank, they had to get their loan. Their appraisal came in lower than what we were asking. Uh -huh. And they wanted to go a lower price. And we said, no, that's the price. And they paid it. And they paid it, yeah. And I said, let me just tell you, just because you bought my house, you're going to get blessed. Yes. Yeah. Look, I know that sounds cocky and arrogant. I know that does. But the anointing of increase is on me. It's on me. Now, you know, I don't believe it. Oh, let's just stay broke. And I don't mean that in a rude sense. For God's sake, man, it's like you drown in this water and God sends you a man with a boat. Should I get in it? Yes. Get in the boat, fool. You know? I mean, how many times God got to tell you to do something? Because he just wants to bless you. Uh, you, you want something I missed? If you go over the Hillsborough Bridge, if you leave here, Armand, you go over the bridge. We call it the Hillsborough, uh, what they call it? I just, the Hillsborough Bridge, what I call it. You go on the West Bank. When you get all the way to Highway 90, you, you see a bunch of different overpasses like this. Everybody know what I'm talking about? My good friend who's now in heaven named Leonard Love calls me up and said, let's go drink coffee. I said, Leonard, you know I don't drink no coffee, but uh, I'll drink something. Him and George and me and Lenny. He said, I just feel like buying a piece of property. I said, buying a piece of property? What do you mean, Lenny? He said, it's $3,000. I had $1,000 in my pocket, Nate. $1,000 in my pocket. George had $1,000 in his pocket. We all, he, they drink coffee. I'm drinking, I think, a Coke or something. I don't know. He said, let's just buy this. I said, this is junk. And the Lord said, listen to Leonard. But you see, I let what the land looked like determine my decision. And when God explicitly said, listen to Leonard. I said, George, you, you gonna, you gonna, he said, it's a thousand dollars a piece. I said, do you know anything about this land? Leonard? No, I don't know nothing. He said, I was just driving by. <laughs> and I just, they said, for sale, I just felt like buying it. Y'all want to go in with me? I've been knowing Leonard Love for a long, long time. Great man. He's in heaven today. Just a great man. Well, I said, I, I don't think I'm going to do that. George said, Leonard, I, 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 I ain't going to do that. He said, well, I'm going to just buy it. Y'all my friend, you know. I said, okay. Three months. Leonard calls me and says, <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? He said, the state of Louisiana, on that property, y'all didn't go in with me. Just gave me $3 million for it. 
Now, a thousand dollars and a million, I'd have made a million bucks. Now, what is that? That's a thousand fold. <laughs> Me and George said, uh, 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 Leonard, you must have known that. No, I didn't know that. He said, but you know, he said, I just thought maybe I might want to be it. He said, and every time I look at that money, I am so glad y'all didn't invest my money. <laughs> And for years after, Lynn would look at me and go, <laughs> that's where I missed it. You know why? I would not invest in his dream because I let what he was doing determine what I did when I should have let the voice of God determine what I do. I will never forget that long as I live. There ain't no telling now. I mean, the state coming in. Just, and that was the first figure. I said, Lenny should have held out for more. He said, Jesse, three million on three thousand ain't bad. I said, no, it ain't bad. It ain't bad at all. <laughs> just said, oh, Jesus, it ain't bad at all. <laughs> Jesus, forgive me. He said, I forgive you, but you're a million short now. <laughs> See, God's got opportunities all out there for you today. But will you let the circumstances and the world around you determine what you do? Or will you get in that prayer closet and say, God, I'm going to dream this dream. I'm going to believe what you said, even though it doesn't make any sense to my natural mind. But I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. And guess what? They'll see you and you come and they go, whew, behold that dreamer coming. Hallelujah. You see my point? Did you enjoy it this morning? Yeah. Give the Lord a great shout. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. And now, that was just a business proposition, but how many, so many other things that God will do for you that is just beyond, beyond human reasoning in every area, even when you think it ain't working at all. And if you don't get in a hurry and you stick with that still small voice and when you show the devil that you could care less how long it takes, he'll walk away from you. See, he's a flesh devil. If he sees it, he's very frugal. If he sees what he's doing to you is not bothering you, he's going to try something else. He's going to take the pressure off you. Right Boom, and then your tsunami comes in before he has time to turn around and then you get hit with what you believe in God for. Spiritually, physically, financially, whatever. So when somebody tells you, behold, that dreamer coming. Uh, here he comes. Who thinks he can do anything? Say this publicly in front of everybody. Yes. Thank you for reminding me of my scripture that I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And greater is he was in me than he was in the world. And if God be for me, ooh, ooh, ooh can be against me and no weapon formed against me going to prosper yes. and I will say of the Lord he is my refuge my God in him will I trust yes. Come on. Yes. and it don't make no difference what's happening in life and it's amazing what God will do stand to your feet pastor come on up here in just a minute I'll turn it over to you we've already prayed for people ministered to people let me tell you what I'm going to do when you go home See, when you go home, this meeting ain't over. Not with me. I'll be on a plane flying somewhere doing something, and I'm going to have you on my mind. I promise you, I'll pray for you. I like the old Pentecostal statement. I'll bombard the gates and all that, whatever the, how they used to say, all that kind of stuff. I want every part of your mind blessed. I say it publicly, and Covenant Church know this. I ain't going to get this whole church debt free. Now, we got a lot of them debt free already. But we're going to get this whole church debt free. And the amount of money that we're in debt to be in some liquid finance somewhere in some finance institution, do whatever they deserve. Yeah. How long is it going to take? How long is it going to take? You see what I'm trying to say? It don't make no difference what the world does. So Jody, my daughter, she used to say, Dad, everything you touch prospers. I said, Jody, I create my world and I walk in it. She was just here. That was Jody. If you look at it, you can tell us. We look a lot. That's what I used to look like when I was young. You know, uh, you know, she always was prettier than me, but I'm just saying I had the same color hair and all that kind of stuff. 
And I have taught her that. And she's successful, not because of her daddy. I know people think that sometimes. That's not true. It's what we placed in her. And now Meredith is seven years old, and we're putting it in her. Meredith, we're going to bless you beyond your wildest dreams. Okay. <laughs> but you're going to work, baby. You're going to work. And you're never going to get what we call in South Louisiana the big head. Oh. You're going to honor everyone you ever meet. Because you're going to become lovable. A genius to love and a genius to be loved in every area of your life. How many of y'all know your dreams are coming to pass? Yeah. What I'd like to say, and then Nate come, I'd like you to tell people next year to get involved in this here. Because it's designed to get yours to come to pass. Do you understand? This is the only meeting that I do at Jesse's at, at, at Covenant Church. Am I correct? Uh, I'm talking about, uh, Kathy does glorious, but I'm talking about me. A JDM event. I mean, I could do so many more other things. I can do healing meetings. I can do prosperity seminar, all that kind of stuff. And I do that when I'm preaching out, you know, things of that nature. But this year, I said, if I can get the world to stop thinking the way God said, if all, and I'm going to deal with this tonight, I just want to, that all our visions begin to become infused, begin to come together. We can get this gospel to the world. And the Bible says when the gospel is preached to the world, the end shall come. You know what that means? We're going to get out of here. And then we're going into the universe. So we can say, live long and prosper. <laughs> that ain't by accident. That's not a Hollywood thought. That's a church thought. Right. Uh, Leonard Nimoy just passed away and they asked him, where'd you get this at? He said, when they were creating the series uh, Star Trek, he said, I was looking for a greeting for the Vulcans. And in his church, which is Jewish. Synagogue. What's that, baby? Synagogue. In the synagogue. They would say as they lay, they would do this. Live long and prosper. In the synagogue. So he presented that to Gene Roddenberry, who was the uh, creator of the series of Star Trek. And boy, that has become worldwide. You, don't, you can go anywhere. You can go in the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa. <laughs> Every time I hear Amazing Grace... I think about Spock when he died in one of the movies, Spock, especially with bagpipes. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Boy. It's not like this. It's live long because to really, truly enjoy prosperity, you got to live long. So people can see the dream in fruition. Don't miss tonight. I tell Holy Ghost gonna move again greatly. I'm gonna go home and get the mind of God. I can't wait till you guys write me letters, all you that have churches, all you that have businesses, and says, my business has exploded. I had one man write me, he said, now I am global in the sheetrock business, drywall. And when I first came here, I could, I could barely keep an office open. He's global now. I got so excited. I ain't asking for his money, and he loves that. I, I, I don't get around you so you can give me some. Uh -uh. I just want it to happen. I want to be able to go, and so I see you going. <sighs> of course, if you get blessed, it's an automatic that I'm blessed because we're in the family of God together. Amen. Give Jesus one more hand clap as pastor in the family. Of we have been preaching on the title... I hope they say that about me in Exodus chapter 37. One very familiar statement. Joseph was a man of great character and great, great wisdom. But not when he was young, because you have to learn those things. And naturally, his brothers didn't like him. And I want to use this one statement. This is part three of this uh, of sermon here. And it's verse 19. They saw him coming. And they said one to another. Well, let me go up to verse 17. And the man said, they have departed from here, for I heard them say, that, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Verse 18. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said one to another, 
look, behold, this dreamer cometh. I hope they say that about you. Because without a dreamer, the world does not exist. So I want to go over some of you had notes in Thursday night, part one. I preach that until you see tomorrow, you will never understand today. The reason why most people have never understood what's going on right now, they've never looked over into tomorrow to just understand why this is happening today. I told you you were created to be sustained by having a vision of something bigger than just today. I told you vision requires faith and it also makes life more enjoyable. It's wonderful to live by faith. I told you dreams and visions keep you prepared. Why? So Satan can't sneak up on you because you're ahead of him all the time. See, you're already ahead of him. He don't know. He don't understand your dream. He's just trying to stop anything you're trying to do. And then this morning, I told you when you and, and last uh, Thursday night, I went over this. When you know what you are pursuing and when you know what is coming, your days become faster and easier. And I love this point here. And, and I ministered to this. Uh, this morning, as well as last night, too, you're not receiving according how fast God can do things or answer your prayer. You're receiving according to your faith. Matthew chapter nine, verse 29, according to your faith, be it unto you. So it, what's, if you're getting a delay, it's not God withholding anything. Just increase your faith because faith cometh by hearing. That's what the disciple said. Lord, increase our faith. I told you this morning that dreamers have ideals and always attain something no matter how much they stumble and fall in their progress. You see, everybody's fallen or made a mistake sometime. But if you're a dreamer at heart, it's going to come to pass because dreams have no expiration dates. You can get them at nine and ninety. See, we're talking about vision here. Yours. I told you this morning, dreams have a sense of responsibility. That leads to a direct accountableness to God. You have, a, you have a, a, a responsibility to your dream and to the person that's hearing your dream. That's why when you give to my ministry, I don't just shout and go, glory to God. I have a responsibility to believe with you and for you for that 30, 60, 100 fold in a thousand times. Most ministers are receiving, go home and say, glory to God, we had a great offer. No, I, ca I carry that with me. Now, Lord, I said, they answered, they did it. Now, it's my responsibility to believe with them just like they're believing for themselves. Now, what I love about dreamers, they just love them. I told you this, that dreamers ha have, dreamers have the genius to be loved greatly. Why? Because they have the genius to love greatly. You see, let me say it again. Dreamers have the genius to be loved greatly. People love, they love Joseph. But he also had the genius to love greatly. I told you we must, this morning we must reverence the ties God has placed amongst us. Never make an enemy without a very good reason. See, sometimes a bridge start burning, things just mess up. But the Bible said, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Didn't say he make him a friend. He said he make it even his enemies to be at peace. I said this too, when passing through hard times, never become broken spirited. How do I do that, Brother Jesse? It's done by determination. That's why Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished this course. I kept the faith. He wasn't, oh God, they're going to kill me today or they're going to cut my head. He could care less. His determination saw the end result of his ministry and his life. Now I want to deal with this and I know it's at 909 but it's Friday night in the New Orleans area. And if you're down at Chris Owens on what Raw Street, I mean on Bourbon Street, they're just starting to drink right now. They ain't worried about the time. Some of them got to go to work. They don't care. It's party night. Listen to this. People have asked me, why have your dreams manifested so much. I've had some of the biggest preachers in the world say that to me, and I thought that was so odd. And I thought, what do you mean, you know? And I am known for a man of character and integrity. I have been uh, introduced as a man of great character and integrity. You see, I will never cut you. I give you my sword. If somebody cut you, it's not me because you got my sword. I don't do that. Here's the point. Write it down. Your character must always rule your conduct. You want your dream to come to pass? 
You want them to say, behold, this dream will come. What? Your character must always rule your conduct. Purity doesn't exist without the conquest of impurity. Let me say it again. Your character must always rule your conduct. Purity doesn't exist without the conquest of impurity. You see, David had a dream and he dreamed some dreams. He made some mistakes. You don't tell your old brother, your older brothers that they're going to worship you uh, uh, and bow down to you. And plus the father who is a patriarch. But he was a man of great character. He ruled his life by his character. He's in a pit. He sold to his cousins. He's thrown in a prison. He winds up at Potiphar's house. Dreamers are intelligent because they know how to dream. They recognize his ability, but part of his wife recognizes something else and tries to get his attention. And I told people, and he was accused of having sexual relations with part of his wife. He was young. He didn't have a lot of sense. He ran out the house with no clothes on. You can't run out of a woman's house with no clothes on and say, I didn't do nothing. (laughs) Because then ain't nobody going to believe you. But he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? His character carried him to the fruition of his dream. His conquest of impurity made him pure. That's why he went from the prison to the prime minister of Egypt. He had great power in that last office of his. It saved not only Pharaoh and the economy of Egypt, but it saved the nation called Israel. You got to understand something about God. He don't ever forget what goes on. It's always amazed me why God said the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I said, that's not right. Because you changed Jacob's name. Why didn't, why didn't you say after you changed the name, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel? Because that was his name, Israel. He was no longer called Jacob, which means rascal, subplanter. I mean, he could cut a deal on you real quick. But yet God put it through the scriptures, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when it should have been the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. There's a little revelation. Actually, it should have been the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau because he was the firstborn. Think about that. Jacob and Rebecca, his mama. That's why you should never show favoritism in any way, shape, or form if you have more than one child. I had a man tell me one time, you are not a parent, Jesse. You and Kathy are not parents. You've only had one child. You've never had this in the back seat of a car. Mama, Harry's touching me. <laughs> and the fights go on and all that kind of stuff. But his character brought him to his fate. He was a young man. He was a good looking man. I don't doubt that part of his wife wasn't a bad looking woman. She might have been very good looking. But he had the cause greater than his hormones. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? What happened? Your character must always rule your conduct. I'm not the ugliest man in the world. I get hit on every once in a while. Can you believe it? I had one preacher not long, too long ago sit two women to my hotel room, knocked on the door because you're saved by grace. And said, Brother Jesse, we've come to minister to you. And like an idiot, I said, I have my fruit basket. <laughs> I had a fruit basket. I didn't get it because I don't think that. Now, when I wasn't saved, I thought of a woman as a sexual object to be conquered. I never saw an ugly woman in my life. I was a heathen of heathens. I dated girls that were 11 years old when I was 19. I dated women at 55 and I was 19. I liked your grandma, your mama, and your daughter. I was full of the devil. I'm not proud of it, but I have to tell you the truth. God has saved me greatly. (laughs) 
Don't act like I'm the only one that done this. But when I got born again, not only did I receive the spirit of the Lord, but I received his purity to conduct myself accordingly. Finally, I said, what did y'all say? We've come to minister to you, whatever you need us to do. I said, hang on. I called Kathy. I said, Kathy, there are two women outside. And these are no sweat hogs. These are some pretty women. <laughs> what should I do? She said, call security, fool. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, girls, go home. But, but our pastor said it's our ministry. How can you believe such a stupid thing? Because we're under grace. You've heard it. While you're watching pornography, just say you're the righteousness of God. And as you do that, it will modify your flesh. Your flesh don't need to be modified. Your flesh need to be crucified. Not modified. Think about that. How can anybody ever believe such a... And yet, oh, I mean, if you, if you listen to some of the stuff they're talking about grace today, it's amazing how it gives you power to sin because it don't make no difference what you do. Or this other teaching. Well, I didn't, my spirit didn't do that. It was my body or my soul that did it. Why don't you tell your wife that if you commit adultery? Honey, my spirit did not do that. She said, well, then I will kill your body. If she don't believe that, what makes you think, since you seem to know who God is talking to in 1 John? And you got the gall and audacity to believe that any of that junk can happen. You want my litmus test for a right doctrine? Let me say this worldwide. I'm right! Let me give it to you. You want to know when God is is saying something to the church? You want to make sure that this doctrine is of God? If it makes a provision for the flesh, it is not of God at all. Because there is no good thing in the flesh. My purity has been tested. I went to New Zealand, or was it Australia? My, my Australian staff was there. Kathy was not with me. I got to say it. Some of you may remember me say, I went down there. And Kathy going, oh, Jesus. No, I got to say it, Kathy. <laughs> I wanted her to come, but Wallace, she didn't want to go. No, ah, shut up, woman. <laughs> oh, God. No, I don't want to talk. Yes, it, it's my sermon. You, hey, sit down there. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> no, I ain't listening to it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I finished preaching. Russell was there and Kay. Well, Russell and Katie back there. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Now, they didn't know this was going on. And I was at a nice hotel. So I, I got back. Uh, uh, Brian, it must have been, I don't know, what, 10, 30, 11 o'clock, something like that. And uh, I said, boy, I mean the anointing. We had a service. Lord Jesus, it was wonderful. Now, Russell, was that in New Zealand? Was that in Australia? Which one? You remember? I can't hear. It. It? Where? New Zealand. Watch this. So I called the front desk. I said, do y'all have a, 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 a workout room here? Oh, yes, sir. We have one that's open 24 hours a day. If you want to go job, we, got, we have fine equipment. Boy, I was feeling good. Cause holy Ghost was moving, Caleb. I had a close. So I went down there. And so I put on some gym shorts and a T-shirt. By the time I got down there, you know, it's 11.05, 11.10. Man, I work out. I did four miles on the treadmill. I was pumping. And, hey, if y'all know, I've been, I've been trying to gain some muscle. Watch this. Did you see it? <laughs> Did y'all see? Watch, watch, watch my chest. Did you see it? <laughs> I was excited. So I go down there. I get on that treadmill, boy. I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. I'm, and I don't know that a test is coming. I'm just like Joseph. I don't know this is about ready to happen. Man, I do my four miles happy. I'm in good shape, boy. And I thought, boy, I cooked some weights and I did some curls and all that kind of stuff. You know, trying to build back some muscle and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I hadn't taken a sauna in years. And I saw this big sauna and I thought, well, you know, nobody in the, not, nobody in the, in the, you know, in this. Nobody was in there. Yes, right. <laughs> nobody was <laughs> Let me go over here. She's messing me up here. <laughs> nobody. 
Nobody in the, not, in the club. You know what I'm talking about. They call it a club. That's what I'm trying to say. So I said, I, I said, I, 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 I ain't taking a sauna since I'm young. I'm going there to take a sauna. Now, most people get in a sauna, but I always keep my shorts on because it gets hot now. You don't want to burn your butt. You know what I'm saying? You can sit on that stuff. There's a dry heat and all that kind of stuff. So I cranked that thing up to about 160. Man, and I go in there, and I'm sitting down there with a gym shorts on. And most people just go in there with hardly any clothes at all, you know, because they're sweating and all kinds of And I got my, my, uh, uh, my shirt on. Well, I'm just, I mean, just, I mean, because I just come off the treadmill. And all, I am just pouring sweat. I hear a door. I hear somebody in there. Doo, 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 doo. I thought, well, somebody must have come in, start working out. And I heard the door of the sauna. And he goes, Ear. it opens up, and a woman comes inside the sauna. She goes, hello. I said, hi. And she has a towel on, wrapped from here down to about here. She pulls the towel off, <laughs> naked as a jaybird. <laughs> the first thing I think of, oh, my God. Not because the woman's naked. I've seen lots of naked women. I, I, I don't mean that. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> it's hard to say this. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know. But I'm messing myself up here. When I was a sinner, let me finish the sentence. When I was a sinner. Okay? When I was a sinner. Look at Kathy. <laughs> she takes the towel. She lays it on them boards. And lays down right here. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I gotta get out of here. But I'm thinking, I freeze. So if you open the door, maybe there's somebody with a camera. <laughs> I'm like Joseph. I didn't do nothing. <laughs> my, my purity was being tested. I mean, Roy, I'm trying to get, I, 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 what am I going to do here? You know, and she said, excuse me. And I went, yes. <laughs> she said, would you pour some water on the rocks? The, you know, the rocks of the sun so we can get a little, I guess, I don't know, humidity, steam, whatever. I said, yes, ma'am. Huh? Kathy said, why did you listen to it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to think, how do I get out of here without nobody seeing me? So I, Denny, I pour water on the rock. Now this woman neck, neck, laying neck as Jay, her feet is this far from my leg. She says, you know, I don't understand why you don't take your shorts off. You know, it's so hot in here. I said to myself, I said, uh, you want some more water on the rocks? <laughs> Finally, I said, this is it. I'm, I, I'm taking a chance. I pulled the wall, I said, well, you have a nice sauna, and out the door. I mean, why am I running? I looked around, see nobody, and I'm running down the hallway. Let's got to get to my room. I made it safely. Well, the next morning, Russell K. says, and there's something that hardly ever happens in America. Uh, those fine hotels there in New Zealand, they, 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 they give you breakfast of uh, a de- not, I mean a fine breakfast or whatever. What do they call that? Whatever. Whatever. And I'm supposed to meet my staff. Now they don't know this has just happened. But last night. So I ain't going to say nothing to them, you know. What are you going to say, you know. So I said, I got to go to the front desk. I said, Russell, I'll meet you in a minute. Because he was there in the fire. I said, I'm going to go to the front desk. And I had to do something. forgotten forgot now what it was. And I hear this voice. Oh, honey, I want you to meet this man. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> it's the naked woman. I didn't want to turn around. She said, honey, honey. She said, sir. And I turned around. She said, honey, this man was so nice to me last night at the sauna that he poured water on the rock so that it could help me to breathe. He was so nice to me. And he looked at me and he said, thank you for helping my wife. Isn't she beautiful? I said, she ain't bad. <laughs> What else she going to say? She ain't bad. <laughs> Look at God. <laughs> she done lost her joy right there. <laughs> My point is this. Purity was tested. But my character is what gets me to my destiny and makes my fate. You see what I'm saying? The conquest of impurity 
was done away with there. Now I want you to listen to this. Great ambition and conquests without contribution. Let me say it again. Great ambition and conquest without contribution is without significance. How will history remember you? How will history remember your dream? What contribution have you done with your dream? What ambition and conquest will people remember? Let me say it again. Great ambition and conquest without contribution is without significance. How will history remember you? Think about that. And if you will, but ambition and conquest with contribution, your dream will be so significant. They will speak about you for thousands of years. And history will remember you well. And that's why we still talk about Joseph, because his contribution and his ambition and his conquest was with great significance. To the point that he forgave the brothers that wanted to kill him and save their lives and their children and children's children. You see, the end depends upon the beginning. The end, write that down, depends upon the beginning. You see, if Jesus tarry, how will history remember me? They won't remember me for building a building. People have built buildings. They're going to remember me from stopping people from suicide. From bringing joy. For getting them out of debt. To show them how to live by faith and not by sight. And it will go on and on. You see what I'm saying? Because what happens is my dream and my vision is now infusing CJ with yours. You see, what God is doing, all of us may have different dreams and things, but at, when it all comes the end from the beginning, when it all happens, it all turns out to be the dream of God. Yeah. And we're all a part of this glorious, significant history. So I love it when they say, oh, he believes in crazy stuff. He's a dreamer. Yeah. Because I am making history. Not so they can just remember that, but to understand the reason for it. That God would be glorified. That's why Jesus said, if you ask me in my name, the Father will be glorified. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. St. John 14, you go read it. See, he is interested in one thing, to glorify his Father. So he is a great example to follow. Now, I want to say this, and I want you to listen to me. You're looking at a man that is an avid reader. Without sounding prideful or arrogant, I can talk to you on just about any subject. I have a very phenomenal library. As, as far as religion, but different thing, but I, I, I seek knowledge constantly. I like input. Listen to this. Not knowing what happened before you were born is to forever be a child. Why am I preaching the gospel? I had to go study all those that came before me, that great cloud of witnesses. And if I would not have known their dreams, their aspirations, I would forever bind myself to be a child. Because, see, you got to know why people do what they do. Let me say it again. Not knowing what happened before you were born is to forever be a child. Or in other words, God had called me as a traveling mission an evangelist to the, to the lost and a revivalist to the church. So, Jeannie, what I had to do is go back. And I got a set of books years ago called 20 Centuries of Great Preaching. Some of you may have that in your library. And I've read these things, these great men, the G. Campbell Morgans. You talk about an expositor. S 
uh, Spurgeon. And I begin to read why they did what they did. John Calvin. Even though they said some things, brother, that I did not believe in terms of, you know. But I had to know that I would ever put myself in prison and would never grow. I would forever make myself a child. You see what I'm saying? And I find that a lot of things that these men and women did were infused into my dreams as I would go out in the world and preach this gospel. Do you see that? I never just wanted to be a child. Because the Bible said, you know, when, when you become a man, you put away childish things. You must know your heritage of faith and your history of that great cloud of witnesses because all of them had dreams. Now, if God would rewrite the book of Hebrews chapter 11, would you be in the chapter? And you know, a lot of them stumbled. Samson stumbled terribly, but he's in the chapter. Moses messed up, but he's in the chapter. Abraham caused the Mideast problem. And Sarah. But he's in the chapter, and she's in the chapter. I need to know that. Why? So I will not be a child all the days of my life. God said be childlike, but he didn't say be childish. See, your dream is not something that's just childish. It may be childlike. And I refuse to ever be a child. I want to grow to the fullness of the statue of Christ. I want my dream to infuse with you. When you gave into our dream, that's just one facet of you infusing with me. Every time I pray for you, every time you pray for me, when words of knowledge went forth and you received them. So those things that God's going to speak to you, Caleb, and, 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 and sweetheart, listen, I'm a part of that now. Isn't that amazing? Never thinking that your grandpa would become my spiritual father. B.B. Hankin. I asked him, what does B.B. mean? He said, Billy Bob. <laughs> Billy Bob. Yeah. And your grandfather that I know of, I'm probably the only man he ever asked. Because everybody wanted him to be their spiritual father. But he came to me. He said, Jesse, would you be my son? I had no idea of spiritual father. I was raised Catholic. You do what you got to do. I said, what does that mean? And I needed direction and guidance. And a lot of people asked me today, who's your spiritual father? I said, I'm an orphan. Because <laughs> he went home to be with the Lord. And if you come to my offices, or especially in my boardroom, there's a picture of Billy Bob Hankins and Velma Hankins. You know why I remember them? I got involved in his dream. You know why he wanted me to be a son to him? He got involved in my dream. And it fused together with the dream of God. Think about that for a minute. It was a blessing. In Hurricane Katrina, when there was devastation everywhere. Oh, Lord. I never want to go through that mess again. I called Steve. I got a hold. Remember that? I, got, I said, Steve, are you all right? That shocked him so much that I would call and ask, do you need anything? He was not under my ministry, but he has the same dream. Now, he may be different in certain areas and things. That's why I called you, Wally, because the Lord said, call Wally. I didn't know you were walking in the yard thinking about what just happened. You, you know, Wally said, y'all know what I'm talking about. But see, you got involved in my dream. I got involved in your dream. I said, Steve, are you okay? You all right? Do you need anything? Do you need any money? You all right? He said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine. Thank you, brother Jesse. And then he became my spiritual son. It was just amazing. And, I, and without sounding being critical, just being honest here, being truthful. I said, you have never had a spiritual father. You had a master. You do this. Or else. 
You pay to be my daddy. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. It's the last night and you're getting out of town. I didn't realize how hurt he was. Not being critical of anybody, but it was just the truth. God told me something about Dexter Easley. I went and preached at his church. I didn't know Dexter from anybody. And the Lord said, help him. I said, okay. What do you want me to do? Open doors. I said, okay. And I did. And I'm not bragging about that. That's not the issue. He got involved in my dream. Quit thinking about money. That's one so small facet of that. And I got involved in his. Nate, been knowing him for years. Years. I preached for him when he, in Seattle, when his children were little. Now they're grown. He got involved in my dream even before he came here. I got involved in his. And God infusing it. Closing it. Into his dream. So that people would say, look at them dreamers coming. What an honor to be called a dreamer. And that title of this series is, I hope they say that about me. Jerry Savelle looked me in the face years ago and said, you are such an encourager. Why is that, Jesse? I said, because I've been discouraged. No one cared for my soul. They didn't. They didn't care. They didn't care. And I made up my mind that I would care. Not bragging on myself. And the Lord, I, he said, that's me, Jesse. You're acting like me. Yeah. I had to learn. I stumbled sometimes, just like Joseph did, said some things I shouldn't have said. Made some people mad because they misunderstood it. Maybe I could have said it a lot better. Let me just say that. But, the, you know, at least I said it. And now I'm known as, a, and without sounding private, a man of character and integrity. I love saying this. It's one of my greatest things. In 37 years of full-time ministry, 39 years of preaching, I've never had a scandal. None. Sexually pure, financially pure. That's not hard. I passed the purity test. I passed the money test. Isn't that amazing? I was tested just like Joseph was. Those things will happen in the prison, in the pit, and in the palace. As someone told me about that, preaching that. Yeah. There's always some kind of test somewhere going on, you know. But when you understand that you have contribution with significance instead of without it, your history will be remembered. Let me say this in close. Your accomplishments should pass your own lifetime. And survive into the lives of others. Your story should become their story. Let me say it again. Your accomplishments should pass your own lifetime. And survive into the lives of others. Your story should be their story. I never had a chance to meet Smith Wigglesworth. He died. I believe before I was born. But I had a. I say this in close. I had, I was asked to preach in Bradford, England, which is where Smith Wigglesworth lived and owned a home. So when I got to the church, they were all excited that Jesse the Planets was coming. They said, is there anything we can do for you, Brother Jesse? I said, yes. Where can we take you? I said, I would like to show my respects and go to the grave of Smith Wigglesworth. Would you like to see the home that he lived in? I said, I would love to do that. He said, there, is there any other dead people you'd like to know about? <laughs> Remember that, Kathy? I said, no, that's fine right there. So I went to the grave as I walked out. 
of the car before the pastor or before the person that brought me had he assigned a person to us, me and Kathy. The grave guy that took care of the graveyard, he said, you're from America? I said, yes, sir. You've come to see Mr. Wigglesworth's grave? I said, how do you know that? He said, Americans come all the time. I said, I know some things about Smith you may have never known. Would you show me his grave? Yes, sir, I will take you to it. He brought me to it. And it says, Smith Wigglesworth, his wife, his daughter. I said, did you see his wife there, sir? Yes. He raised her from the dead. He went, ooh, that's good. (laughs) I said, he raised her from the dead, sir. Anybody else in your cemetery raise their wife from the dead? It shook him up. And you know, a Muslim owns his house. Because no Christian, well, they should have bought that thing. You know how many visiting people would go see where Smith Wigglesworth lived? And you walk from here, maybe to the, out to the gate, and that's the park where he prayed. I followed his footsteps. He's not my favorite preacher. You want to know who my favorite preacher was? And I never met him neither. George Whitfield. Oh, God. This is the man that stood and we had so many people coming and the churches were so mad at him. He said, I go to the fields. It was called field ministry. Could he preach the gospel? I found his grave. Remember that, Kathy? I found where he went. I said, oh, God. I read his book. What a man of humbleness, but a fiery preacher. He didn't know it, but he actually died of a heart attack. I saw the place where he died and the place that he was buried. And then I told Brother Hagin that. And he said, Jesse, can I give you a word? I said, yes, sir. And he leaned over to me. He said, be careful that you don't get too close to that. Or follow too close because the same things that happened to them will happen to you. See, because I was infusing myself in his dream, and I did. But I thought, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. And Brother Hagin spoke that to me. I'll never forget that. He said, it's good. He said, he was something, wasn't he? I said, Brother Hagin, he was something. He said, hey, Jess, tell me about heaven. I said, you've been there. He said, let's swap preaching stories. <laughs> now, Brother Hagin could tell some stories. It was a great day. And I thought I could learn. But when I, there is, in my opinion, no man in this generation has ever done the work of George Whitfield. Shut down wars. Walk out on the battlefield with cannons blowing and blood bust and just stop. In the name of Jesus, preach the gospel. And the two sides would drop their pist- uh, rifles and fall on their knees and just ask God to forgive them. He went to America 14 times and every time he went, he got the whole ship saved every time. And there were some heathen guys on them ships. I think you've studied George Whitfield too, haven't you? What a man. But he didn't know how to treat his wife correctly. He said, oh, he loved his wife, but he couldn't tell him because I must give my life to God. He's the one who came up with the statement, I'd rather rust out than wear out. Or wear out than rust out, one of them. (laughs) He preached to 60,000 people in a field. You know who took care of it? You know who printed his sermons or his tape ministry? Benjamin Franklin was his printer. And Ben Franklin said... There's no way anybody can hear George Whitfield with six data. This is documented history of America. No way can anyone hear his voice. So he went to one of Whitfield's meetings, Benjamin, Ben Franklin, and stood at the back and he could hear 
with Phil's voice, as clear as he was standing next to it. God was amplifying that man's voice. That like you be in the Superdome and you talking with no microphone. And he preached it. He said, and through the first part of his message, I decided to give him my coppers. Which was his pennies. He said he got halfway through, I gave him my silvers. He said when he finished, I gave him my gold, my silvers, and my coppers. He said, I ain't going back over there no more. <laughs> Could he preach the gospel? He had problems. He believed in predestination. And his good friend from England, John Wesley. Wesley, oh, was jealous of Whitfield. In fact, Wesley's brother, let me tell you, Charles uh, Wesley, who wrote hymns, great phenomenal hymns, he said, what's the matter with you, John? Because it was through Wesley's ministry that Whitfield got saved. But he was pulling more people. And when he found out that, Whit that Whitfield believed in predestination because he was a Calvinist, John Wesley jumps up and says, I, I slammed my foot against this damnable doctrine. And Whitfield would cry and say, oh, Brother Wesley, let us just preach Jesus Christ. But yet Wesley preached his funeral and honored him. And their dreams infused and it's still working in me so you remember this visionary leadership conference because your dream will infuse with everyone around you and it will bring forth what God has called that will be done did you enjoy it tonight stand to your feet I know it's a little late it's 947 Really not that late at all, to tell you the truth. It has been such an honor. Pastor Nate, I need you know you need to make a couple of announcements. I'm gonna turn this over to you. We've already prayed and believed, moved in the Spirit of God. Remember this statement. Encouragement is the oxygen of the soul. Breathe. Because a new day is coming. And you, and because of your character and your understanding, it will produce what you've been believing for. And this white-headed man will rejoice with you as you receive what you rightfully deserve by God Almighty. Give the Lord a standing ovation as Pastor talks.